Good afternoon. Welcome to our symposium on light pollution, light at night, a glowing hazard. My name is Annie Yang, and I will be your host today. I'm the chair of the Environmental Action Committee and volunteer with the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society on behalf of Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, the CR Club Loma Prieta chapter, and the CR Club Bay Alive campaign. I want to thank you for joining us. We have four very distinguished speakers today who will talk to us about the effects of light at night and strategies that can safeguard our health and environment. First, we have Dr. John Barentine, Executive Officer and Principal Consultant at Dark Sky Consulting, followed by Dr. Travis Longcore, Associate Adjunct Professor at the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Then we have Dr. Christine Shepard, Director of the Glass Collisions Program at the American Bird Conservancy. And finally, Ms. Mary Coolidge, the Bird Safe and Lights Out Campaign Coordinator for uh, Portland Audubon. Before we get to the speakers, we have a very special welcome by California Assembly Member Alex Lee, uh, a dark sky champion, a true dark sky champion in our state legislature. Assembly Member Lee currently represents California's 25th district, which includes several of our South Bay cities. He was elected in 2020 and serves on several committees, including education, transportation, and business and professions. And he's also the chair of the Select Committee on Social Housing. Most recently, um, Assemblymember Lee introduced AB 2382, a bill that would have made state buildings and structures more dark sky, bird, and ecosystem friendly. Unfortunately, after the bill passed both California houses of the legislature, it was vetoed by the governor this go around, but I'll let him talk more about that. I'm so glad you can join us, Assemblymember Lee, and congratulations on your reelection last week. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Annie. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be joining you all here. Uh, it is actually morning for me. I'm in Japan right now. We are on a California delegation trip learning about energy and trying to share and learn knowledge about from Japanese officials. So my time difference is a little different right now. So actually, it is still dark right now for me as well. But I'm really pleased to be with you all today. As Annie said, I'm Assembly Member Alex Lee. I represent the 25th Assembly District, uh, soon to be 24th Assembly District, which is Northern Santa Clara County and Southern Alameda County, and I'm excited to talk about our efforts last year, this last legislative cycle, to try to reduce artificial light at night. Of course, research shows that artificial light at night, also known as Allen, has increased, has increased to unprecedented levels globally and in California. This has resulted in a disruption of, to circadian rhythms in plants and animals, which harms our ecosystem. Light attracts nocturnal migratory birds and diverts them from safe migration routes to human environments, where they are more susceptible to collisions with buildings and other human-made structures. And a study found that reducing indoor artificial light at night by half can result in roughly 60% fewer bird collisions. In at least 19 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, uh, they have laws in place to reduce light pollution, which include, includes limiting uh, artificial light at night. And as Annie talked about, my bill, Assembly Bill 2382, was an attempt to reduce excess artificial light, which is affecting ecosystems and can disrupt critical behavior in wildlife. The bill would require all outdoor lighting fixtures installed or placed on state buildings and structures after January 1st, of 2023 to have an external shield to direct light to where it is needed and be equipped with an automatic uh, or shut off device or to be motion activated. The reason the bill focused on state buildings was to show as a state, we can take these types of steps to prove that a reduction of light pollution is possible while saving energy and helping the environment. We had a broad coalition of support, which included, of course, Audubon, California, the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, the National Parks Conser Conservation Association, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and the American Bird Conservancy. But even though we had a huge coalition and a lot of great support and even great coverage in, uh, in, in news, the bill, uh, of course, was passed through legislature without an issue. Uh, almost unanimous, and it was unfortunately vetoed by Governor Gavin Newsom, citing cost concerns. Uh, but we brought the attention to, to this issue and increased awareness, and it was even on the front page of the LA Times recently, and it featured in a segment on CBS. And I feel strongly that 
It is a sensible reform that promotes safety for animals, insects, and people. And I'm committed to working um, to working on this issue with our stakeholders going forward. And this is, of course, still a bill that I'm interested in carrying and continuing to work on because it is so important that we can do something so small in which we can save our migratory species, reduce our electrical um, usage, and save costs. It's a win-win in so many fronts, uh, but we have to look beyond these short-term uh, cost improvement, capital improvement costs. But I'm really excited to be able to kick it off for you today. And thank you so much for having me on this uh, afternoon slash morning for me. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Lee. Uh, please, yes, continue to fight for protections for our night skies at the state level. And I hope many of you in our audience and your organizations will also join him. So let's get to our first presentation. I'm very honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. John Barentine. Dr. Barentine is a professionally trained astronomer and the executive officer and principal consultant at Dark Sky Consulting, a company offering professional services in the areas of light pollution, dark skies, and astronomy. Many remember Dr. Barentine for his influential work as the manager of the International Dark Sky Places Program and director of public policy for the International Dark Sky Association, or IDA. He is a committee member of many dark sky and astronomical organizations. And he recently authored a report for IDA called Artificial Light at Night, State of the Science 2022, which we highly recommend you take a look at and we'll put a link to that report in the chat. We're excited to have Dr. Barentine introduce the topic of light pollution for our program today. Um, and as a reminder, we will be taking questions at the end of the four presentations. So please type your questions in the Q&A section at any time. Welcome, Dr. Barentine. Please go ahead and share your screen, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Annie, for that lovely introduction. I'll go ahead and begin my slide presentation. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate today. Thank you for uh, to Assemblymember Lee for his advocacy on this issue and leadership in California. Um, and what I will speak to you about over the next about 25 minutes is an introduction to the broader problem that we'll be talking about today. And we'll increasingly narrow that down to the issue of, of birds and the conservation concerns that are associated with it. So I'm going to start and give you sort of the 30,000 foot view of the issue, as it were, um, with an, a specific focus on cities, because a lot of the problem that we're experiencing with light pollution um, especially here in the West, is really traceable ultimately to our cities, but they're also the solutions to the problem are to be found there. So just as a, a brief overview of my presentation, I'm going to talk to you about that big picture, put this in context, uh, what the problem means in a global sense, and then narrow it down to our cities and talk about their reach. So how is it that the case that a, a city can influence uh, the conservation status of a species that may be hundreds of miles away, for example. I'll also talk about the role of cities in not only creating this problem, but potentially solving it. If we kind of rethink the way that we light our cities with newer urban lighting design, um, how we can get a good outcome from this so it's not all just doom and gloom. And I'll summarize that with a vision for the future. What could our cities be like in a way that they would contribute positively towards solving this problem while retaining all the light that we need at night for the many various human activities um, that have become indispensable to our society. So first of all, what is the big picture? Um, you're going to hear this term that Assemblymember Lee used throughout my presentation and others, uh, which is artificial light at night. So I figured it was a good place to start with um, a, an explanation of this and a bit of a definition. So the, the words sort of suggest what we're talking about here. Artificial in the sense that this is light that's caused by human activities in one way or another. Um, it's light, so it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation, and it's happening at night. So it's when we don't have the dominant natural source of light in our environment, which is sunlight. Uh, and in, in that case, there would be other natural sources in the environment, but we are supplanting that with our own light emissions. And broadly speaking, Allen, this artificial light at night, falls into two categories. There's an outdoor version that's suggested by the picture of the New York City skyline at top right. Um, that's mainly what the focus of my talk will be. There's also an indoor version of it. Increasingly, we're hearing about this, especially as it has to do with concerns about human health. 
Uh, exposure to light at night seems to be bad for people in many respects, uh, but that's a subject of another talk and today I'll be focused on the outdoor Allen. So what can I tell you about um, Allen in general? One thing that I can tell you is that it is an increasingly global phenomenon. This is an image of the earth at night uh, that is produced by NASA and is called the black marble. And it was produced over the course of a year using satellite images of the earth while the satellites were on the night side. And they stitched together this panorama of the earth from many thousands of individual images that were all taken under conditions where locally there were no clouds. So it looks like it's night everywhere at once and that there is no weather on the earth so that we can see the night lights. The continents are outlined pretty distinctly from the oceans, which are darker. The continents are sort of bluish from moonlight during the study period. And what really dominates this view besides the continents is that sort of golden glow, which is the Earth's cities. That's all light caused by human beings that is being emitted into the nighttime environment, some of which goes directly up into the sky where it is detected by uh, Earth orbiting satellites. So this is not um, a phenomenon merely of the West or of developed countries in particular, although you can see areas like North America and Europe and Japan light up very brightly. Uh, developing economies like China and India are rapidly showing up on this map, um, but it's not just a map of where the people live. For example, I can guarantee you that in Sub-Saharan Africa near the center of the image, uh, that's where about a billion people live, and yet their part of the world is not brightly lit compared to others, which has something to do with the development level. So even though um, there are certain areas where there are very few people and we don't see a lot of indications of light, um, this really is a global phenomenon now, and it has certain consequences. I can also tell you that Alan is unnatural, which is sort of implied by the word artificial in the acronym. But to really drive this point home, what I'm showing you here on the left are a series of spectra where we have taken light sources and used uh, prisms, for example, to disperse the light into the colors of the rainbow. And I'm giving you spectra of various light sources, starting with a very natural one, which is sunlight up the top and stepping through different kinds of human caused light that you see labeled on the right. And the sunlight spectrum is a more or less what we would call continuous spectrum. So Essentially, all the colors of the rainbow are represented there in certain proportions. And you'll notice that as you step down through those different light sources, their spectra or the colors that they're emitting are increasingly unlike uh, sunlight to the point that if we're talking about uh, LED lighting or fluorescent lighting, the spectra of those sources looks very different than sunlight. And that has important biological implications because our biology developed in a world in which these artificial sources did not exist, much less uh, emitting light at night. So from that perspective, the impact that we see on biological systems is very significant. And it in part traces back to this idea that the color of that light and the timing of its emission into the environment is distinctly unnatural. I can also tell you that the use of artificial light at night across the world is really growing out of control right now. This is probably the most technical slide that I'm gonna show you and it requires a little bit of, of explanation. This is the result of a study that was done in the first half of the last decade using that map of the world that I showed you previously where the researchers looked at each country's share of that light emission and they looked at two quantities. The one I'm showing you on the left called area is the percentage of that country's land mass that shows some indication of artificial light at night. And then on the right, I'm showing you a quantity called radiance, which is the quantity of light emitted by each country. And the color coding here is showing you how those quantities changed over the course of the study period, which was from 2012 to 2016. So if a country shows up in a red color, it means that quantity was generally increasing by some amount during the study period. And the cooler colors, the, the grays and blues, are where it appeared to decrease. And you'll notice two things. One is that there are very few countries in which the quantities were decreasing, where uh, the lit area on the left was decreasing during the study period, particularly in countries like Syria and Yemen. That was due to civil wars that were ongoing at the time. So this is telling us a bit about human activities. 
Um, but you'll notice that also the majority of the countries in both of these quantities, they're reds and yellows. They're increasing, generally speaking. And both of these quantities, both the lit area and the radiance, were increasing in this study period on a global average of about 2% per year. So about twice the rate of the human population growth during that time. But some of these countries saw increases during the study period in the double digits of percentages year on year. So this is a really significant issue that's increasing right now at a rate that vastly exceeds the rate at which our human population is growing. So that has a consequence associated with it that you will also hear in a term called light pollution. There's no one definition of this uh, term, but here's one that I like, which focuses on adverse effects or impacts that are attributable to the use of artificial light at night. And I say adverse effect or impact in order to distinguish this from useful light that's performing some service for us on the ground. It's lighting our way at night. It's showing us potential obstacles in the way. Um, it's helping us um, be more safe and secure at night. But there are many instances where that light is not reaching its intended target or it's being broadcast into the environment when it's not needed. And when we add up all of those effects, it creates what we call light pollution, which has analogs in the environmental world to other forms of natural pollution. So a way of thinking about it is that it's, it's polluting a resource, which is natural darkness at night, and there are consequences um, when we do that. So what do we know about light pollution besides some of the, the graphics that I've shown you up to this point? We kind of got an impression from the map, perhaps I showed you, that quite a few people in the world live in places that are light pollution. An example of uh, an environmental effect that we can attribute to uh, light pollution is something called sky glow, which is what brightens the night sky and makes it difficult to see the stars beyond. The visibility of the Milky Way is an indicator of a, what we would call a dark sky, which is relatively free of light pollution, but about a third of people live in places that they cannot see the Milky Way at night and under any circumstances. And the interesting factoid here, I think, is the last one that almost 90% of Europeans and more than half of the US population experience a perpetual twilight. So it's the sky never drops below a brightness that you would experience in the hours around dusk and dawn when there's still some influence of sunlight uh, in the atmosphere. And that's really just a profound change to the nighttime environment that really has no historical uh, precedent. And you're gonna hear more from the other speakers today about uh, the biological impacts in particular. Uh, and that's one of the aspects that has us most concerned. So ultimately, why is this happening? Why do we have a problem associated with light pollution? It really comes down to an overuse relative to what our needs are. And that overuse is a result of a, a wasteful mindset and how we use a lot of natural resources, not just artificial light at night, and I think that that sense of wastefulness uh, arises from the fact that there's just a lack of awareness. A lot of people don't think that light at night could be a bad thing. They think of it as a, a social good, as something that's beneficial to society. And they don't give a lot of thought to what other effects it might be having on the nighttime environment. So this is already beginning to suggest what the solution to this problem will be, which is by changing the relationship that we have to light at night. Um, but we can start to turn this around and begin to improve the nighttime environment by reducing light pollution while keeping all the light on the ground that we really do need. And at the end of the day, as, for as much as been made of the environmental benefits of LED lighting, I can tell you that this is making the problem worse. It has made light cheaper and easier to consume. And a result of that is that there's more of it now in the environment that there was before the LED revolution began a little over a decade ago. And a lot of that light has the kind of characteristics that are among the very worst for the nighttime environment. So we have to balance the notion that LED is good from an energy efficiency perspective, which it is with the fact that it's enabling people to use more light in many cases where it's not even needed. So where do cities come into this? I've kind of suggested that cities are part of the problem by some of the images that I've been showing you in the background. Um, and they, they are part of the problem. And it, the reason why is that they really have an outsized influence. 
Alan really defines our cities at night. Here's an image of the Bay Area that was made by an astronaut aboard the International Space Station a few years ago looking down. They see our cities very brightly uh, and it's easy for them to take still photographs out of the windows. You can see here that the city streets are pretty well defined by where the street lighting is. You can see highways. You see variations in color that are associated with different kinds of land uses. They're using different illumination sources at night. Really, this is the defining characteristic of our cities. And it would be one thing if that light stayed where it is emitted, but it travels very far away from the source. And that, again, has to do with the, the lack of control and the waste that's associated with what we call light pollution. So and as an example of exactly how far away that light can go, here's some data from a US National Park Service study that was done a few years ago looking at the city of Las Vegas in Nevada. Uh, and as, as many of you know, uh, the, the famous uh, tourism slogan of Las Vegas is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But I can tell you that the one thing that does not stay in Vegas is it's light at night. These are some measurements, which are the uh, X's and O's overlaid with a solid line that is the model that they used in this case, where they looked at the light at the top of the sky. So what we call the zenith as a function of the distance away from Las Vegas city center. That's on the, the horizontal axis. And what this shows is that if you uh, compare the amount of light in the night sky to what would be there using, uh, if there were only natural sources, this so-called all sky light pollution ratio that there is on the vertical axis, that there is still more than 1% artificial light in the night sky when you are at a distance of over 250 kilometers from the center of Vegas. So if you think about what sort of, of, of land area is affected by the light of Vegas, it's a footprint that's more than 100,000 square miles in size. So these cities are having this outsized effect on territory that's very far from their own. Uh, and again, if we're concerned about birds, for example, on migratory flyways that are seeing lights in the distance and are being drawn away from those routes, cities are really the core of this problem in many respects. So dense populations that are associated with cities generally mean higher light emissions. Here's a little cutout of uh, the map that I showed you earlier of the Earth at night where you can begin to pick out, for example, the major European capitals that are very evident, but you see the smaller cities in the surrounding countryside. And again, with the reach of that light being so far away from those cities and towns, you have to go very far now to try to find natural darkness. For example, if you wanted to see the Milky Way. I'm next gonna show you an overlay that takes that same idea as before, that ratio in this previous slide of the amount of light you actually see in the night sky to the natural background and it color codes it. And what I mean to show you here with this example is that in some places, and in fact, in, in parts of Europe in many places, that natural nighttime darkness is already gone. So in the map now, that ratio is the false colors and it ranges from out over the oceans where there's essentially no artificial light at night at all to the cores of the bigger European cities where the ratio is in the dozens or even hundreds of times above the natural background. And you'll notice that across most of Central and Western Europe, there just aren't a lot of those blues and grays. You have to go quite a distance away from the cities to find areas where you could see a naturally dark sky. Now, despite this loss that's been caused by lighting from cities, there is a lot here that is recoverable. And that's the next step is talking about um, what can we do? And the built environment is really key in coming to those solutions. We want to target the useful light in this diagram. We wanna put the light where it's needed at night, keep it away from the areas that it's not, get the timing of the light correct so it's there when people need it, it's reduced or extinguished when they're not. And we're reducing these other unfortunate side effects that I labeled light pollution, which includes all of this so-called spill light, like trespassing into buildings and, and into places where it's not wanted. And some of that is the direct upward light in the upper part of this diagram. That's the light that becomes sky glow and makes it difficult to see the stars at night. So what about cities is specifically contributing to this problem? 
well, fundamentally, we don't like the world very well. Um, here's an image of the outskirts of Paris, France. It's seen from um, an airplane, so looking above the city. And you'll notice that there's an awful lot of light in this image, which means that that light is directed up towards the viewer and not down necessarily down towards the ground where it is needed. But I would argue that we didn't set out to light the world like this. It is the result of choices that have built up over many decades in uh, parallel with the development of um, urban planning ethics during that time. And that by changing the way that we think about light at night and how we use it, we could see cities of the future that don't really resemble this anymore and are better lit for both humans and the wildlife that inhabits these areas. Uh, one of the problems, obviously, with dense uh, urban cores is that we have multi-story buildings that are emitting a lot of light at night through their windows. And by simply shutting off lights inside these buildings, we would make the world a safer place for birds and other species that are confused by this light uh, and ultimately collide with these windows. So that's one point of leverage that we have is that we could do lights out programs or you know, other approaches to sort of mitigate this light that we're putting into the urban environment that's coming from high rise buildings. There's a lot of so-called historical lighting in cities, especially in downtowns. And that those fixtures were made decades or a century or more ago under the presumption that it was probably a gas flame that was inside those light fixtures. They've been replaced with LEDs, which are vastly brighter. But the way that the light is emerging from the fixtures doesn't put a lot of it on the ground where it's needed. So we then need supplemental light. We use, we use even more light than we did before. Um, and we're making light pollution worse as a consequence. So we may have to rethink some of these ideas about how we do historic preservation in order to maintain the daytime appearance of these fixtures while limiting their uh, contribution to light pollution at night. And of course, who hasn't seen a news story like this somewhere, right? You know, tired of crime, neighbors light up their streets. And maybe this is not exactly what we want, even though we can acknowledge that, uh, you know, there is a nexus between light at night and safety, and we certainly want to promote that, but there are diminishing returns. And if we're just shining bright light into people's faces at night, we're not necessarily going to improve the situation with uh, crime or public safety. I can tell you that there is some research that says that light levels at night correlate with a feeling of safety, which is important. We want people to feel reassured when they're outside at night. But that's also a case of diminishing returns. And according to this data from a study that was done in Israel a few years ago, you get a strong increase in a feeling of safety when you take a completely dark area and you add a little bit of light to it. But as you add more and more and more light, you don't get the same return on that investment and you don't get people feeling safer about being in those spaces at night. So it's about better design and just not more light in order to make our streets safe and to have people feel safe being on those streets at night. And the other problem that works against us in cities is that the lighting standards that we use are often not really well backed by uh, empirical evidence. Um, and that's, you know, here some leading lighting researchers are saying that out loud in their papers that, that the recommendations we have right now are really not well founded in evidence. Um, and that we need to go out and figure out what the right light levels are in order to light our cities correctly. So lastly, in the, the few minutes I have here remaining, I'm going to wrap up with a vision for the future of what our cities could be in a way that would make light better for people at night on the ground and keep more of that light out of the night sky where it's disorienting to birds and makes it difficult to see the stars. So for one thing, we need to get the right lighting in place. And that is taking into account all of these characteristics of lighting when we make decisions about street lighting, about area lighting in places like parking lots. We need to shield lights properly so that light is kept on the ground we need to get the color of the lighting right, which is better for our biology. We need to reduce the intensity of that light to proper levels um, and finally get the timing right so that the light is there when people need it and it's reduced or it's switched off completely when people aren't around. In my view, we would have lighting become a core part of urban planning and design and not an afterthought, which it often is. Uh, Engineers try to light streets according to whatever the standards are, but there's oftentimes light going in every direction in a, a downtown situation. 
Um, this is an image of, of my hometown of Tucson, Arizona, where I think we do it really well. Um, and our situation with crime and public safety during the overnight hours is no better or worse than any other American city, to be quite honest. So we've done it in a way that, that really prioritizes um, putting the, the planning and design piece first and putting lighting up front in that process and not leaving it to the very end of a project. And I think we have a very nicely lit city as a result. Um, in the same way that I think we could all agree that the smoke coming out of these smokestacks is an environmental problem that should be subject to regulation, um, I would hope that we would come to an agreement that all of this excess and wasted light at night is a source of pollution that should be subject to reasonable controls. That's what Assemblymember Lee was trying to work on with his bill earlier this, uh, this year. Uh, and I think that idea is gradually making its way into the world of policy and law, and eventually we will see um, more broad application of meaningful regulations that will reduce light pollution, just as we have environmental laws that have meaningfully reduced, for example, air and water pollution. We need comprehensive um, plans for outdoor lighting everywhere. The picture here is meant to suggest uh, setting up a system of zoning that would be an overlay on land use zones in typical cities where lighting allowances would scale according to actual needs. This makes it simple to follow a prescription when you're developing um, new projects on uh, different lands in, in our cities. We could develop them in ways that are sensitive to the environment but make sure that we give people all the light that they need uh, so that they can be safe to get around at night. This will be beneficial to our urban wildlife, to the human population of our cities. Um, and we think that they just look better when this is done properly. We really do need a revision of international lighting standards, especially for urban settings that have a strong evidence basis. Uh, right now, we sort of make these rules by feel and we need more data to tell us what the correct lighting levels are so that we don't provide too little light or too much light. And lastly, my hope is that societies everywhere will resist this idea that we just need more and more light. We need to consume more of this resource all the time in order to have safe and comfortable cities to live in. And that instead, more cities out there might someday look like this one here in my own home state of Arizona. This is Flagstaff in Northern Arizona with a population of about 75,000 people. And despite uh, that growth that they've experienced in the past decade, you can still stand in downtown uh, Flagstaff and look up and see the Milky Way in the sky at night. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I will hand it back to the organizers now and look forward to taking your questions a little bit later in the proceedings. Thank you so much, Dr. Barentine, for making that case for dark skies and for some pretty sensible ways for us to redesign our built environment to mitigate light pollution. This really sets the stage for the rest of our program. So next, let's dive a little deeper into the ecological effects of light pollution. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Travis Longcore. Dr. Longcore is an associate adjunct professor at the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, the science director of the Urban Wildlands Group, an LA-based conservation nonprofit, and an independent ecological design and environmental policy consultant. His research is focused on nature and cities. And many of you, I'm sure, may know him because his landmark article in 2004 titled Ecological Light Pollution and his 2006 co-edited book, um, Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Lighting, have really come to define this area of study in urban ecology. Earlier this year, Dr. Longcore was awarded the Galileo Award by the International Dark Sky Association. Welcome, Dr. Longcore, and go ahead and share your screen, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Thank you, John, for the, the lead-in presentation. And uh, we'll uh, go a little bit in de more detail here now with the ecological uh, effects of, of light pollution. And uh, so, yeah, so we got started on this really about, uh, well, more than 20 years ago. The, the article there on the left was from 2000, uh, 2002 when we, uh, organized the first conference, international conference on the effects of light at night on on ecosystems. My now wife Catherine Rich and I did that, 
And, uh, and then at around the same time, the National Park Service was also gearing up its uh, Night Skies uh, Natural Sounds Division and was doing these incredible mosaics of measuring light pollution from the national parks. That was some coverage there from 2004. We, uh, just by way of the background here, we did do that article in 2004 and the edited book that came out in 2006 now, uh, really trying to establish this sort of leg of the light pollution stool, as it were. And it really came out of some questions from colleagues at the International Dark Sky Association, where they were back in those days having a hard time getting people to understand that light pollution wasn't just about astronomers and astronomical observation, even though it is, um, or just about sort of cultural loss of night and, and human connection to the sky, although it is, or about human health and human circadian rhythms, although it is, but that it also was about wildlife. And so this work that we started then was really in, in response to those questions of, can we get something together to establish that this too is an important uh, part of the story? And, and really um, what, what it showed at that time and has in the 20 years since is that one, there were definitely precursors back out there that we knew about already that, that just needed to be articulated. And also the amount of not new knowledge that we've added in the 20 years since has really been quite incredible, leading us to a uh, better advice here about how we mitigate, uh, how we avoid, how we calculate the impacts of, of light at night. But when it comes right down to it, you know, it's about it's about losing this. This is a photograph one of my students took uh, using a special camera on the north uh, rim of the Grand Canyon. You can see a tiny bit of light there on the horizon. You can see the glow of a campfire, um, but uh, really that's pretty much uh, a natural dark sky. And just for reference, that's a, about a a two minute exposure uh, in a camera with a special hemispherical lens on it. So we're seeing the entire hemisphere. If you move out to the outskirts of Los Angeles, um, it looks more like this. And that's about a 30 second exposure. Um, you can see the Milky Way through there, but the lights that you see, it's really starting to wash that out considerably all around the horizon. That's Los Angeles and Ventura County and whatnot. And then if you go, to the mountains that bisect Los Angeles itself and take about a five second exposure on a cloudy night, uh, it looks like this, uh, which is uh, when we do the calculations, even brighter, uh, considerably brighter than the light that's, that's uh, given by the full moon. And so we have now places that uh, are basically robbed perpetually of the, the lunar cycles and all the things that go along with lunar cycles. And if you can imagine you're a nocturnal creature that's used to and evolved in the condition of that first photograph and you're living in an environment like this is going to pose some challenges, which is what I'm going to talk to about here uh, just for a little bit. So, there are many ways that we can divide up the impacts of, of light pollution on, on wild ecosystems and wildlife. This happens to be one. Um, I've got kind of four different categories, uh, bins of things that I talk about. One is attraction and disorientation. Uh, and these are the ones that we've kind of known the longest. Uh, the phrase like a moth to a flame uh, has been around for a long time, as you might imagine. Uh, being able to scare even predators away from campfire goes back to pre, uh, prehistoric human societies. Uh, so that's attraction and disorientation uh, associated with that um, and repulsion as well. Associated with that might be something like fragmentation or loss of connectivity, where lights at night create a barrier in the, in the landscape to nocturnal species that isn't obvious if we look during the daytime, or the road doesn't look as, like as much of a barrier, but once you realize that it's a lit uh, environment, that has additional consequences. And then the upper right, we have interference with pollination, foraging, and all manner of ecological interactions. So all these little things that go on between species, is it safe to go out and forage or is a predator going to eat me? Decisions that get made by prey species, um, access to and uh, uh, interaction between insects and plants in terms of pollination, all these interactions are much more subtle than the things that leave dead bodies on the ground, uh, which we will we have. Those tend to be attraction and disorientation. But 
but they're no less significant because they can really structure species communities and distributions as we've learned in the last 20 years or so. And then finally, we have disruption of circadian rhythms, the daily rhythms, the physiological responses of organisms uh, that, that go on that you don't necessarily see uh, just uh, looking from the outside, but you have to measure in other ways, have other manifestations like the time that an animal will breed, when a bird is laying its eggs, when it migrates, the direction that it might go. All these may be tied to lunar and seasonal rhythms or daily rhythms. So all these sort of rhythm things that then have spillover consequences. So I'll try to give you some examples of each of these and then talk about how we how we mitigate them. So attraction and disorientation, this is a picture painted of the Eddystone light in 1912 showing this massive attraction of migratory birds uh, to the light. And, and these birds, you know, often do collide then uh, with structures, can die. Uh, it, it, and we see this across uh, the uh, the, the world today with bright lights, but it goes back, we've known it for a very long time that things get attracted, uh, especially migratory birds, uh, insects uh, get attracted to these lights. Uh, it, it looks maybe a little bit like this. This is a video, if it will run from Chicago from about the time we got started on this. And you see the little sparks of light above the lights on this building. Those are birds. Those are birds during migration uh, that have been uh, attracted off course and are then circling this building and being caught by, I'm gonna go with it was a actual video uh, recorder back in, in 2002. And then the consequence of that, that, we're, that we'll hear more about from, from Chris and, and, uh, and Mary as we move along is birds that are attracted to, to lights end up encountering things like windows, uh, colliding with them and dying. And so we have many, many records of this happening both at, at, in cities, but also at uh, tall structures like communication towers uh, where the birds attracted to those circle around them and then run into the miles, literally miles of cables uh, that hold up our extremely tall communication towers and can result in massive, uh, you know, mortality events, you know, 400 birds in a night. Um, uh, these are the kinds of things uh, that, that happen. Uh, and so we're going on here, just a little illustration of going and finding these birds grounded on the ground, uh, uh, city uh, surface uh, after, after the, the light attraction event. Uh, this happens for seabirds as well. This video from my colleague, Aram uh, Rodriguez, where they are using uh, GPS trackers on um, fledgling uh, shearwaters uh, that are coming out of a nest site. So the nest site is in the upper uh, right in both the images. And uh, the first couple of birds that come out make it to the ocean, that's where they need to go. Uh, but the rest of them get attracted to the lights uh, that you can see in the video on the left. Uh, first two, there they go out to see that one hits the lights and then oh, still back on the lights. The fourth one's on the lights. Um, and this is a problem because they get grounded. Uh, they're subject to uh, predation by uh, predators. And uh, they also have a hard time getting a loft. So you actually have to collect them up, get them back, uh, uh, calm down a bit. And they actually release them by tossing them off a cliff uh, so that they can get some lift underneath them and get out to the ocean where they need to go. So this is uh, something that's going on uh, all the time uh, during breeding seasons for, 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 um, for uh, seabirds. Um, we also have uh, sea turtles that are attracted by lights. Uh, and this is just some recent photographs that, that were sent to me, uh, just showing how kind of sad this really is. This is a light at a resort in uh, Central America. Uh, the those sea turtle hatchlings hatched on the beach. They normally would go away from the darkest horizon. Um, but in this instance, um, there's a light. And so that becomes the thing that they get attracted to. And they've come up onto this patio and all these little hatchlings are just sitting there underneath, uh, underneath the light, uh, just, they don't know where to go and they can't because this is an unnat completely unnatural phenomenon for them. And of course, this results in, in large levels of mortality. People do try to rehab and get these animals back out of the ocean, but the real solution is to deal with the, deal with the lighting. Um, 
we have attraction also in, uh, in of, of insects. This is uh, in the center there is a picture from the Peruvian Amazon from a study that uh, we were doing with the Smithsonian. Uh, these are lights that have been installed at some uh, hydrocarbon facilities that were going to go in and they were going to be lit. And the only question left was what color do we do the lighting? So there's an experiment uh, there on the right hand side. Uh, the fellows there are standing around an experiment, uh, experimental light that has a yellow filter on it to try to reduce the attraction uh, of the insects. It actually does work, but of course the optimal solution here is don't light up the, the Amazon uh, rainforest. Um, but if you have to, uh, for whatever reason, uh, we can reduce that attraction somewhat by using different colors. Uh, but this is what it looks like when you, in, the, in the center there, uh, when you introduce lights to a naive habitat, a biodiverse naive habitat that's never had lights in it before, you get quite a profusion uh, of, of organisms. Uh, and so this is then uh, attraction to lights for insects does result in, in death. This is just a video from my colleague Gerard Eisenbeis uh, showing a single light illuminating a sculpture uh, at a location where he works in Germany. Uh, and every one of these uh, is, is, is hot uh, on top of that lens there. And those insects get attracted to it and then they get fried. Um, so on it comes and that's about how long it takes and then you've just killed another another insect. So these are these are the, as I put it, the ones that leave dead bodies on the ground, um, and then they have consequences, right? There are consequences to this. So pollination is an is oftentimes nocturnal. We we usually think about daytime pollination, but moths are especially adapted and co-evolved to many night blooming flowers, uh, in order to pollinate them, and we have incredible research now coming out of the UK and Switzerland, really demonstrating that uh, light at night reduces nocturnal pollination services. And it does it to such a degree that it actually changes the daytime pollinator community because those nighttime uh, pl plants that get pollinated at the night also have sometimes flowers that are open during the day. And with the reduction in nighttime pollination, you get reduction in overall flower cover and reduction in daytime pollinators as well. Absolutely incredible study that was done by observing thousands and thousands of nighttime and daytime uh, flower insect interactions and then experimentally lighting up a meadow uh, with street lights and demonstrating these, these impacts. A rather incredible work that people have done uh, to demonstrate this and, and now, we, now we know. Right. Another ecological interaction is a study that my colleagues and I did here in Southern California, published quite recently. Uh, we looked at uh, the distribution of western snowy plovers, uh, which do uh, uh, nest and roost on the coast of uh, California, including up in the Bay Area and beyond. Uh, they come, many of them come down here to Los Angeles to roost. So we were looking at roosting sites for snowy plovers in the, in the wintertime. And then also the spawning sites uh, for California grunion, which is this uh, fish that during the full moon, so very bright, uh, you know, naturally bright conditions, uh, and the new moon, Moon will spawn on the beach. And uh, both of these are, are susceptible to predators because they're kind of both uh, tasty little morsels, if you will. And so the question that we asked uh, using a bunch of community science data, people who've gone out and collected information about the distribution of these roosts, the distribution of the, the grunion runs, uh, and then we created a light exposure model that involved taking light measurements on the beach at 515 locations inside that uh, image there, which is uh, Ventura, Los Angeles, and Orange Counties. And uh, then modeling that outward, figuring out the brightness along the beach, other elements of the habitat that were important to these two species, and then figuring out if we could explain what was explaining the distribution of the roost and distribution of these, uh, these uh, grunion runs. And we found two different results for the two things. Um, we found that uh, for the plovers, we were more likely to see it where it was darker. And after, but after you get past about 0.05 lux. And that's about half the brightness of a full moon. So once the light pollution itself was more than about half the brightness of a full moon, we had this really precipitous decline and uh, many 
uh, much uh, less distribution of the plovers in that area. So it's uh, our theory there is that it is using darkness as a refuge from predators, and this is being driven by interspe uh, you know, interspecies relationships where it's afraid of being eaten, basically, if the lights are too bright at night. The, the grunion story is a little bit different because I already said that it will uh, spawn both at the full moon and the new moon. And so we find a maximum there at about uh, a one lux. So it's maybe, which is about the brightness of a full moon, but this is one lux of light pollution. Uh, and it may be that the uh, grunion spawning is being guided a little bit by the lights on the beach. These fish are a little bit attracted to light uh, as, as juveniles, and that may um, you know, hold over into the adults. But once we get past about a tenth of a lux, so the light of a full moon, our probabilities start going downward and, uh, and, and, uh, and reducing it. So very interesting that we found different results uh, for the two that have these two different ecologies and also starts to suggest some thresholds that we wouldn't want to go beyond uh, in places like uh, sensitive habitats like the beach, uh, where we've got species that are either threatened or endangered or, or regulated. Then we have the question of connectivity. This is P22, which is our uh, resident mountain lion in the hills of Los Angeles in Griffith Park. And um, we think a little bit about what the barriers are to a mountain lion in these urban uh, situations. And one of the barriers is, yes, of course, the roads and the roads are what are killing them. But it turns out, if you look in the, in the literature, uh, that uh, juvenile mountain lions try to avoid, unless they have to, do. They try to avoid areas that are brighter. This is research that goes back to the uh, early 90s uh, in Orange County. And we're trying to do some studies now to sort of confirm how this works, how space use of uh, wildlands is influenced by, by light and how light may be acting as a fragmentation. Uh, just incidentally, this image here is the 101 freeway in um, Agora Hills, California. And this is the this is the 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 break uh, between the Santa Monica Mountains, which are those mountains I'm looking southward to right now, and the Simi Hills and the rest of the California wildlands, which are behind uh, this picture. Uh, and in fact, uh, the uh, there will be constructed a wildlife overpass right over the freeway where you see it here. So there will become a dark path that goes through this uh, this environment. And I'm working with the, the designers of it to ensure that we create a path that minimizes the light uh, spill onto it in every way possible so that these animals find and perceive a safe pathway uh, over the freeway instead of occasionally in desperation trying to run across it. But using darkness as the guide there as much as possible. This, uh, this, this fragmentation happens in aquatic environments as well. This is the Sundial Bridge in Reading, uh, which is just horribly, horribly lit uh, with uh, about the worst way you could light it in terms of maintaining the migratory connectivity for the fish that go up and down this river. And so we have evidence. Uh, and there's a new paper about this I've got to read. Uh, just came out and I haven't had a chance to go through it yet about this particular bridge. But in general, lights attra will um, attract predators, aquatic predators who then eat fish who are migrating in or out, or they will attract fish on their migratory pathway and not let them pass uh, one way or another. Physiological responses then, this is a field of, um, of winter soybeans and uh, they will set seed and turn brown once the days get short enough for them to detect that winter is coming. But what you see here in these circles, these sort of half circles of um, green around what is a street light is the street lights bright enough so that the soybeans don't detect that the day is getting shorter and consequently they don't set seed. And so that's really, really a visible thing. You can also see the, the shadow of the street light itself runs a line right through that soybean field where those were like, okay, it's dark enough here. And we think that, that, that winter is coming. Uh, but there's dozens of examples like this in the natural world where there are cues highly reliable cues over millions of years about seasons changing, day changing, lunar changes and whatnot that are just simply erased by light at night. Um, and just to give another one that's a really cool example is reindeer. 
reindeer change the color of their eyes based on the, the, the time of the year. In the summertime, their eyes uh, are yellow, and in the wintertime, uh, their eyes are, are, are blue. Yellow, kind of like uh, sunglasses, as it were, inside, and this is what it looks like. Those are two reindeer eyes came out of reindeer that were killed at different times of the year. The left killed during the winter, the right killed during the summer. And light pollution can interfere with this. There is an example, they found a green reindeer eye. Well, what was that? reindeer that was kept in a pen where there were some lights that were over the hill from it. And so it was too bright for them to fully adapt to their, um, their winter eyes, as it were, and fully pick up the, the subtleties of the light that's available in the Arctic night. Um, so all these things can be dealt with a little bit if we think about the different light perceiving systems across organisms. Um, humans see we're used to seeing what we see, right? We've got three, uh, three photo different photoreceptors. We see yellow all the way through to blue and violet. Well, deer don't. They don't see orange and red. Um, and so there's a lot. There's a bunch of mismatches out there between human vision and and wildlife vision. And I'll show this to you really in a, in a couple of examples. Some species see over into the ultraviolet, so that's shorter wavelengths past violet and purple that that, that we don't see, uh, but that others do because there's a lot of ultraviolet in in sunlight. Uh, and so many insects are very attracted to ultraviolet light that they're seeing, but we're not. Um, so the peak of our vision is sort of in the middle of this graph, and the peak sensitivity of insect vision uh, in, uh, on average is, is much shorter wavelengths. Um, I've taken and, and overlaid all of the visual responses of all the different organisms that I could find in the literature for the past, whatever, it's 70 years, and uh, summarize them here. And what you'll see is human vision, daytime vision peaks a little bit to the right of this, this uh, graph here. This shows the peak of most, the average animal in the world has a peak right here in the green. And a lot of organisms have a peak over here in the ultraviolet where uh, humans aren't seeing any, anything at all. Uh, but human vision, it turns out, uh, our peak sensitivity where this arrow is at the top is a bit to the longer wavelengths. And so what that suggests, and we can look at this by different group, we can look at birds and insects and, 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 and spiders and whatnot, and see the different shapes of these responses across species to different organisms. But the summary of all of this is the only place where we can try to let light be visible to humans so that we can have the safety that we want to have at night is to use the longer wavelengths and not the shorter wavelengths because of these other species, including other mammals, other insects that have much higher sensitivity to, to the shorter wavelengths than humans do. Um, and that then translates into summary metrics that we have for lighting. There's a thing called correlated color temperature for lighting, which is expresses how much yellow or blue is in it. Blue are short wavelengths, yellow are long wavelengths. Low color temperatures look yellow, like this thing I've got here on the bottom. Very high color temperatures look uh, blue. And I've used all some of these animal responses to create a wildlife sensitivity index and shown that the higher your color temperature is, the greater the uh, impact is going to be on, on, on wildlife. Uh, this will be updated as we learn more and, and summarize more, but the, when, when Dr. Barentine talks about using the right color, um, overall, it means going to less blue light and more yellows and reds uh, and, and, and oranges. Uh, that doesn't solve all of our issues with uh, birds, because birds tend to have a very broad visual sensitivity. And so this technique doesn't work as well with birds, but it certainly works really well uh, or better, I would say, with, with, with insects that, that birds count on. So if we want to think ecosystem-wide, um, we, we do want to think about this color temperature question. The exception to that are uh, species that communicate using bioluminescence, like fireflies, because the yellows uh, that we're talking about tend to intersect like with the yellow of a firefly at dusk. And so there are exceptions uh, to this rule. Uh, and in those instances, you've got to just avoid the light. Um, so finally, uh, to minimize the adverse impacts of light, 
put it only where you need it, turn it off when you don't need it, only use as much as you need, direct it where it needs to go, and then use the lowest possible correlated color temperature or more yellow light uh, than blue light for the goal of the lighting. But together, all five of these things uh, can all be implemented and still have safety and comfort and, and really appealing uh, urban landscapes. It's just good lighting design. So with that, I'll stop and we'll pick anything up uh, in the questions uh, as we move along. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Longcor, for that discussion of the adverse effects of light pollution on ecosystems and wildlife. That photo that you showed of the sea turtle hatchlings, uh, just heartbreaking. And examples like that are, I think, really why this problem is so important, and I'm sure why many of us are here um, at the symposium today. And the five strategies that you mentioned at the end, I, they make a lot of sense, and I hope we can all keep them in mind when we think about lighting in our own homes and communities. Now, to continue with more ways that light pollution affects wildlife, specifically birds, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Christine Shepard. She is the director of the Glass Collisions Program at the American Bird Conservancy, or ABC. And Dr. Shepard established ABC's Glass Testing and Evaluation Program, which is the lead foundation for, which is the foundation for lead credit for reducing bird collisions. And if you haven't seen how ABC does their testing, uh, make sure you listen to the end of Dr. Shepard's presentation. It's very fun and impressive. Dr. Shepard has published and consulted on bird-friendly building design and related federal and local legislation for over 20 years. I'd like to welcome Dr. Shepard to join us and go ahead and share your screen. Um, as a reminder, we will be answering questions after our last speaker, so please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A section. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Shepard. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. I am going to talk in more detail about only one way that um, light impacts birds, but you'll find out that it, that one way um, has a lot of different implications. So uh, this is a video a bit like the one that Travis just showed. Um, it's something that we call a circulation event where birds uh, become trapped in bright beams of light. Um, this particular example is from the 9-11 Memorial in Lower Manhattan. And in this case, uh, New York City Audubon volunteers uh, spend the night monitoring the beams. And when large numbers of birds are trapped, um, they make a phone call, the lights are turned off for five minutes. Um, so there are no real negative impacts, but that unfortunately is not true of circulation events around the world. Um, this phenomenon was first noticed in the late 19th century um, when uh, people started to lamp things like uh, lighthouses um, and uh, you'd have the first skyscraper in a city would be lit up. Uh, the Washington Monument or the Statue of Liberty were, were lit up. Um, and uh, particularly when there's cloudy weather, which makes birds fly lower, um, you would often get major kill events uh, associated with these circulation events. Excuse me, I'm trying to get rid of my Zoom bombing cat. Um, now, we, you know, we tend to think of birds as largely diurnal. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, that this is an issue for birds, um, bright light at night. Um, primarily, this happens because birds migrate and many of them migrate at night. Um, so uh, they're crossing the skies, they're in unfamiliar areas um, and bright lights of cities um, are, are impacting them almost immediately. Um, Travis also uh, showed us uh, that circulation events happen at um, cell phone towers. Um, and you can definitely see you know, that circling something like that is gonna be for birds like going through a cheese grater. Um, there are also uh, circulation events uh, typically associated with uh, brightly lit drilling rigs uh, in places like the Gulf of Mexico um, and uh, the North Sea, again, where lots of birds are migrating and they um, intersect uh, the areas where there is this bright lighting. We don't see um, the major kill events as frequently as we used to. 
Um, and this is largely attributable to the increase in light pollution over the last 100, 150 years. So you can see in 1873, Houston had 20 streets um, and probably not very many lights. Now uh, the lighting footprint of Houston is actually larger than the state of New Jersey. Um, and in some ways it's almost amazing that migratory birds make it down the East Coast at all um, because there is so much bright light. There's a tendency to associate lighting and bird mortality with tall buildings. Um, and I think that goes back um, to those early days where there were collision events at uh, the Washington Monument, you know, and the Statue of Liberty and so forth. Um, but it's not just the tallest buildings that are causing the problem. Um, the Fatal Light Attraction Program in, uh, based in Toronto did a study um, and what they found was that the light emitted by buildings, the amount of light emitted by buildings was the strongest predictor of the number of uh, bird carcasses found around those buildings uh, later in the day. We have evidence that the lighting on roads um, can change bird behavior, that even street lighting is enough to change bird behavior. And Parking lots and um, even spotlighting in people's gardens can impact uh, bird behavior. So what this means to a certain extent is that our existing lights out programs don't go far enough. Um, if you turn out the lights on one building and it's surrounded by brightly lit buildings, you're really not going to accomplish a lot. Um, and this is uh, one reason why the, uh, approach of Assemblyman Lee is so important um, because we can impact many, many more buildings, many, many more people um, through legislation um, than we can simply through um, talking to them and trying to persuade them one at a time. But what we've really found um, is that our intuition that birds are sucked into the built environment by lighting um, is, is accurate. There have been a number of studies over the last couple of years um, that have really demonstrated that you are seeing more birds in the built environment than you would expect if they were distributed randomly across the landscape. And of course, where you'd prefer to see them is outside of the built environment. Um, and this is where what I do comes in um, because uh, as, as birds are in the built environment, um, they are faced with they're basically lost in the funhouse, um, trying to deal with, with glass, experiencing severe mortality. So just to be clear, we're not talking about um, the situation where a bird like a cardinal or a robin repeatedly uh, flies against a, a window. Uh, this tends to be territorial males um, that are fighting with their own reflection. It doesn't usually, uh, cause them uh, injury. Um, it might waste a little of their time, but it's not really a serious problem. Um, what we are talking about is a situation where birds fly at full speed into a pane of glass, not realizing that it's there. And this results in death, serious injury. Um, as many as a billion birds every year, just in North America are killed by collisions with glass. Um, this was a number that was uh, determined by the Smithsonian. It was published in, in uh, 2014 um, by uh, Scott Loss and his team. Um, he's now at the University of Oklahoma. There are peaks in collisions with windows during spring and fall um, because of migration. Um, collisions can happen at any time of year. There are peaks in winter as birds leave their territories. There are peaks in late spring as uh, local birds are fledging young. But the highest peaks happen during spring and fall migration, um, particularly to songbirds um, as they go between their breeding and wintering grounds. Um, these birds migrate at night, as we've said before. Um, they're may be a number of different reasons that they do that. One um, is to fly when the sun isn't beating down on their backs. 
Um, there are fewer predators. Uh, air currents tend to be calmer at night, um, but also because these birds have to stop periodically to refuel. Just as you know, when you're driving across the country, you have to pull off every so often to get gas. Uh, these birds have to stop and uh, feed up for a day or two or three um, to replace their energy reserves. Um, and they need daylight to feed by. Um, so that is when the bulk of collisions occur. Um, these birds are not typically uh, flying into buildings as they're migrating. Um, they come down into brightly lit areas um, as they're finishing up a stage or because they're attracted by the bright lights. Um, but it's in the morning that they're flying around and most collisions are taking place. People don't really understand why this happens because most people believe that they can see glass. Um, and it's not true, we get injured by glass doors and, and windows um, all the time. Um, but we're able to understand glass as a concept, glass as a transparent barrier, trans glass as a barrier that can uh, reflect like a mirror. Um, birds don't understand glass as a concept. What birds see, they take literally. Um, and they don't understand the cues that we use to predict where glass is um, in the environment. So if I take away the cues that you use, you won't be able to tell me if this is a picture of a tree that I took, if it's a tree seen through a window, a transparent glass window, um, or if it's the reflection of a tree um, in shiny glass. When I give you a bit more information, you know that there's got to be glass involved. You can see a crack, you see mullions. Um, but it's only when I show you this that you understand it's a reflection. Birds don't understand any of the cues that tell you that this is reflective glass. They don't understand that right angles are not part of nature to start with. Um, most collisions take place in what you could think of as sort of the bird activity zone. Um, this is very similar to most car accidents taking place within 10 miles of home because that's where you do most of your driving. Birds are attracted to vegetation from the ground up to the top of the tree canopy because that's where they find resources like food and shelter. Um, it doesn't mean that there are no collisions um, away from vegetation, but the majority of collisions um, take place on glass that reflects vegetation. And you can see why that would happen. The birds are brought in close to the glass. They try to fly to the reflections of the vegetation in the glass. As I said, up to a billion birds are killed every year by collisions with glass. Now, there's a tendency to think, well, okay, this must be a problem of skyscrapers. Um, but ironically, um, very few collisions take place on skyscrapers. Now, one of the main reasons for this is that there are very few skyscrapers relative to other kinds of structures. Um, collisions do take place on skyscrapers and they tend to take place on the lower floors, the ones that are in that bird activity zone. Almost half of collisions take place on homes and businesses, buildings of one to three stories. Um, and most of the rest take place on low rise buildings from four to 11 stories, which is approximately, as you can imagine, up to the height of the top of the tree canopy. Um, so that's a very strong correlation um, between glass that reflects plants um, and glass that causes collisions. Now there are solutions. We can actually do something about this problem um, and it helps to understand a little bit about bird vision, um, to understand you know, how we do this. We're primates, we've got eyes that are close together, uh, we've got flat faces, we don't have a beak sticking out between our eyes. We see more or less the same thing with the left eye and the right eye. This gives us good depth perception, um, gives us three-dimensional vision. And we tend to perceive the world as something we're moving into, something that's in front of us. 
Now take a look at a bird. Their eyes are on the opposite sides of their head. You can imagine not seeing the same thing with your left and right eye. Um, they do have a beak that's between their eyes um, and they don't have very good depth perception because their eyes don't overlap very much. Um, they have other ways of telling how fast they're flying, when they're going to reach their destination. But to them, the world presumably appears as something they're immersed in and what's to the side and behind them can be just as important, if not more important than what's in front of them. Um, so another important thing to realize is that birds are very aware of their body size. Um, birds fly through complex environments. Um, if you have watched birds, you know that they can fly into something like the trees you see on the left there um, very quickly. They, they don't flutter around looking for a root. Um, they can respond quickly um, and they understand how big they are relative to gaps that they may be trying to fly through. Um, this super swallow in the middle um, is an extreme example. Um, this bird is flying through a gap that's only about an inch wide between two barn doors to get to its nest inside the barn. Um, but what we found from research by people like Dr. Dan Clem and Mr. Martin Lusler um, is that a gap of two inches or less um, will usually stop birds from trying to proceed. Um, this, is, this is where birds, small birds, um, decide um, that it's better to go around than to try to go through. And if you're a bird, um, if you're flying through a habitat on the left, um, which is very open looking, um, you might not be paying much attention to what's ahead of you because you believe that the area is open. If you're trying to fly through a cluttered environment like the one on the right, um, you're very likely to have most of your attention focused forward um, because you have to navigate through this complex set of branches. Um, so what we do to try to make glass safe for birds um, is try to convince birds um, that what they're faced with is a complex cluttered environment with spaces that they can't really penetrate. Um, so this uh, has generated what we call the, the two by two rule. Um, you can put visual markers on glass um, and as long as they're spaced essentially two inches in any direction, most birds will not try to fly through. Um, now the birds have to be able to see the markers um, if they're too small, they won't do any good at all. Um, the general rule of thumb for this um, is about an eighth of an inch for lines or a quarter of an inch diameter for dots. Um, but by no means is it essential um, that you use only dots and stripes. We see a lot of dots around um, as people are starting to uh, employ bird friendly materials. Um, and we're, we're hoping that people will start getting more creative. In fact, irregular patterns seem to draw birds' attention better than regular patterns do. Um, so Annie mentioned um, our tunnel testing um, and this is the contraption that she was referring to. Um, ABC now has two test tunnels. Um, this is our first um, which is located about an hour east of Pittsburgh um, in Rector, Pennsylvania at the Powder Mill Avian Research Center, which is part of the Carnegie Museum. Um, this is a protocol that was developed in Austria um, in the early 2000s by Martin Rusler. Um, it was a direct response to country after country installing transparent highway noise barriers um, and in every country, um, what they found was that these transparent highway noise barriers caused huge numbers of bird collisions and bird mortality. Um, Austria, in, the, the city of Vienna in particular, decided uh, they needed to do something about this. Um, and so they hired Martin um, to figure out 
how do we tell um, when something will deter bird collisions? Um, so he created the first tunnel um, and the way it works is pretty simple. Um, there's a banding station at Powder Mill um, and birds are netted and uh, they're banded, uh, they're weighed and measured and so forth. And some of them come out to the tunnel. Um, they're placed inside and it's dark there. Um, and what you see on the right is what it looks like to the birds. They see two possibilities for exit. Um, one side is uh, clear, it doesn't look like there's a barrier at all. The other side is whatever we're testing. Now, if you look at those lower photographs, you can see that there's a net at the end of the tunnel that keeps the birds from actually impacting the glass. So what we're looking at is what percentage of the birds fly toward that clear glass. The more birds fly toward the clear glass, the more we think they're trying to avoid what we're testing on the other side. Um, and this is what it looks like. The bird's placed in the dark, it flies to one side. Um, we open the door, we let it out, and that's all it is, entails. We use the data that we collect from the tunnel to create what we call a threat factor for the types of glass um, that are being sold by different companies um, as bird friendly. Um, so we take the percentage of birds that are flying, that fly toward that glass, um, and that becomes the threat factor, which means that low numbers are, are good for threat factors. Low numbers mean that not very many birds flew toward that particular type of glass. And we can use these materials and other strategies to design bird-friendly buildings. People have been designing bird-friendly buildings since they started designing buildings. It's only in the last 50, 75 years that the glass industry um, has been able to create panels of glass that allow all glass buildings to be constructed. Um, and this is a really serious problem. The mortality of birds from collisions with glass is causing decreases um, in the overall populations of these birds around the world. Wherever we look, bird populations are declining and collisions with glass are one of the primary reasons for this. Now, we're not trying to tell people that they can't use glass anymore. Um, you can make a bird-friendly building um, and still have a lot of glass. But it's important as you design a building um, to incorporate bird-friendly strategies from the beginning. Um, this means you can do it in a cost-effective way and you shouldn't have additional costs um, to make a building bird-friendly. Um, you can use things like screens and sunshades um, to reduce the exposure of glass so that birds don't see the reflections. You can use glass that incorporates signals. That's the stuff that we test in the tunnel. And you can also reduce glass that really isn't necessary. I mean, think of every conference room you've ever been in where the blinds are never open. Um, luckily, bird-friendly design overlaps with a lot of strategies for doing sustainable buildings. Um, so there are a lot of strategies for uh, controlling heat and light, um, as well as uh, for privacy and security and so forth um, that are also bird friendly. So if you start from the beginning, as you get to that decision point, you know, what am I gonna do uh, to make sure that we don't use too much energy? You use the bird friendly option um, and you get a bird friendly sustainable building. So here's a good example. Um, you can design a bird-friendly glass box if you want to. Um, this is the Intuit headquarters in Mountain View, California. Mountain View is a community that requires bird-friendly design. Um, this particular glass um, has stripes uh, that are integrated into the glass. They're, they're made with uh, tiny ceramic dots. Um, the pattern covers only 6% of the surface. So you can see out very well. 
um, this glass was tested in the tunnel and has a, an extremely good threat factor. Um, so it's bird friendly, but as you can see on the left from the parking lot, you don't really even notice it. Um, so, you know, people are, are worried that bird friendly design, you know, is going to be weird or ugly. Um, don't have to worry anymore. <laughs> Any kind of design can be made bird friendly. This is another strategy that people have been using, um, putting patterns on glass uh, that reflect in the ultraviolet. Uh, this uh, means that some birds can see the pattern. Not all birds see into the ultraviolet, which is important to know when you're deciding on using a glass. But songbirds, which are the most frequent collision victims, do see ultraviolet and can see and avoid these patterns. Um, from the inside, you don't notice the pattern at all as if you're a human. From the outside, from certain angles, the pattern shows up, you can see on the right, um, but it's not very obtrusive. Um, so this is an option um, that we're starting to, to see uh, growing in prominence. There are now a half a dozen different glass companies around the world um, that are manufacturing bird-friendly glass that incorporates a UV pattern. But something as simple as an insect screen works perfectly well. Um, insect screens not only uh, almost eliminate reflections, um, but if a bird does happen to hit the window, they act sort of as a trampoline. So they reduce the impact um, and thus reduce mortality. When I first started with American Bird Conservancy, I wondered why I was in the policy department. Um, I, I guess I thought that as we discovered uh, bird-friendly materials and ways to design bird-friendly buildings, that people would obviously adopt those. Um, well, it didn't take me too long to discover that that was not true. Um, so policy options are really important um, because you can reach a lot of the important people that way. You reach architects, you reach designers, you reach urban planners, um, and you can have a much wider impact than trying to do this building by building. Um, San Francisco was the first to enact bird-friendly design legislation way back in 2011. Um, and if you look at this list, which is uh, probably still needs updating, you can see that there are a lot of other communities in California that have followed suit, that have also adopted bird-friendly design legislation. Um, now, one of the things that this says to me is that they've looked at San Francisco. They've recognized that San Francisco did not have to add new people um, in order to administrate their legislation. They didn't have to build weird or ugly buildings. Um, that in fact, things have been going pretty well. Um, and you can save a lot of birds by enacting bird-friendly legislation. Um, so uh, in addition to California, um, Minnesota has, has enacted a, a statewide law um, back in 2014 um, one of the most recent cities to pass bird-friendly legislation was Madison, Wisconsin. They were actually challenged in court last year um, by developers um, and the court threw out the suit. In Canada, um, there are, are many uh, different communities uh, that have bird-friendly legislation. Um, they've also uh, created a uh, development standard, um, a, a code model that can be adopted by provinces um, as they uh, review their code standards um, every number of years. New York is probably the most important legislation that's been passed um, since 2011. Um, New York passed uh, what is unfortunately called Local Law 15 of 2020. Um, is, is the most stringent bird-friendly legislation um, anywhere on the planet. It requires bird-friendly glass 
um, for the first 75 feet um, of every building. So this legislation covers everything from a uh, single family home on Staten Island uh, to a skyscraper in Manhattan. Um, and it requires that uh, the glass, the bird friendly glass have a threat factor of 25 or less. So they refer directly to um, ABC's testing standard there. Um, and uh, we're starting to see other communities adopt similar legislation. Um, and we're also starting um, to work with a lot of uh, developers that are creating projects um, in New York because of course they all want to use some kind of glass um, that nobody has thought of yet. <laughs> so um, it's very challenging. Um, but legislation is clearly um, the way to go. Um, and much bird-friendly design legislation includes lighting components at the same time. So that's the end um, of my talk. Um, if you're looking for resources on bird-friendly design, um, you can go to birdsmartglass.org, um, which is ABC's bird-friendly site. We have a lot of downloadable resources. Um, we have pages that will tell you everything from um, how do you pass legislation in your own jurisdiction um, to uh, what to do um, about a, a bird killing building um, in your city. Um, and we also um, have a lot of information about solutions for existing glass. So if, if you have a collisions problem on your home, um, we've got solutions on our website that can help you fix that. And thank you for listening. I look forward to answering your questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. Uh, we put a link to um, one of ABC's resource websites in the chat, so feel free to check that out. Um, you know, it really makes the devastation of light pollution tangible when we see how our cute neighborhood birds are harmed. Uh, that's definitely how I first got interested in the topic. So what can we do? And are there things we should be doing at um, the local level in our cities or counties or even at the state level? To tell us more about her experience advocating her city and state is Mary Coolidge. Ms. Coolidge is the Bird Safe and Lights Out campaign coordinator for Portland Audubon, an organization that works both locally and statewide protecting birds and their habitat. She is dedicated to making the built environment more hospitable to wildlife and helping connect people to nature. She splits her time between Portland Audubon and the Oregon Zoo's California Condor Breeding Facility and serves on the board of the Oregon chapter of the International Dark Sky Association, as well as the Bird Safe Buildings Alliance. Oftentimes when people want to know what they can do to protect birds in their cities, Ms. Coolidge is the go-to person for advice. Welcome Ms. Coolidge. Go ahead and turn on your camera and share your screen. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Annie and Shawnee and organizers for having me here to be part of this panel with such an incredibly esteemed group of people. I have to say, I think everything I have learned about light pollution and window collisions, I've learned from the experts that have just wrapped up talking. Um, but so I'm here to talk about how we can use all of this information that we've just gotten from um, Dr. Barentine, Dr. Longcore, Dr. Shepard, and use it to get people on board with changing the relationship that we have with light and being on board with a dark skies preservation campaign. Um, so just to start out a little bit of a roadmap of where I plan to go today. So I want to talk about who our natural allies are in this work um, and, and in three basic categories, who we need to convince in order to influence change, because we know we're not going to do this work alone, right? Um, so individuals and communities, um, professionals, and also policymakers. Um, and so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've done at Portland Audubon and at the Oregon chapter of the International Dark Sky Campaign, uh, at Dark Sky chapter in terms of grassroots campaigns, um, astrotourism, measuring sky quality in Oregon, um, 
the International Dark Sky Places program that's run by the International Dark Sky Association. I'm going to touch on that. I'm going to talk about the work that we have done um, engaging with graduate students, doing continuing ed for professionals working in the field, organizing symposia, um, and participating in those kinds of things. And then policy development. So kind of this long strategic game um, that we started with um, hearing from assembly member uh, Lee talking about the work that they were trying to get done in California. Um, so first of all, I think um, it will probably come as no real surprise to anyone. And certainly Dr. Barentine touched on this. Historically, really the amount of time and effort that has gone into planning um, for daytime environments is much larger than the amount of time and effort that we've put into planning for the nighttime environment. Definitely a lot of the work that we do to plan for the daytime environment has benefits for uh, nocturnal ecosystems. I mean, preserving anchor habitats in our urban areas, requiring eco roofs on some of our larger roofs, setting really ambitious tree canopy targets. All of these things have benefits in the nighttime environment. But if we aren't really thoughtfully designing and managing our lighting, we're actually doing quite a disservice to the nighttime environment and also to the nighttime experience for people that are going outside at night. Um, thankfully, I do think that things are changing. There's starting to be a real growing awareness about the importance of preserving the night sky. And there are programs that actually emphasize this. Uh, the Urban Bird Treaty Program, which is run by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, is a program that emphasizes the um, protection of wildlife in our built environment, in our urban spaces. San Francisco is an urban bird treaty city. Portland, Seattle, all urban bird treaty cities. And I want to mention, maybe not incidentally, that the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation provides funding for urban bird treaty cities and to do the work that they're doing. And, and NIFWF has really funded probably the better part of the last eight years of the work that I've been doing in Portland on dark sky preservation and collisions management. So something to look into if you're looking for funding for doing some of this work and you're also an urban bird treaty city. Um, the Biophilic Cities program also promotes the um, protection of wildlife in our cities and our built environment. Uh, Portland's a biophilic city. San Francisco is also a biophilic city. So another way that we're getting support for doing this kind of work. And then increasingly, we're starting to see dark sky tourism. And um, Travel Oregon and Travel Southern Oregon, both in Oregon, have produced a lot of information about dark sky protection. There's even a toolkit. And in some cases, this is linked to funding opportunities. So something to consider in your neck of the woods as well. Okay, so relationship building is obviously really important in any campaign. And so I think we really need to start thinking about who our allies are in this work and who we can reach in terms of a broader audience if we have a more diverse group of stakeholders. Um, having a diverse group, group of stakeholders also increases the entry points that people can use to get exposed to this kind of work and then hopefully get hooked. Um, so this is just a short list of ideas about who we have built relationships with in our work in Portland and in Oregon. Um, you really want to get creative. So, of course, we're talking about astronomy groups, and not least of all um, of which is high school astronomy clubs. So young people are incredibly energetic. They're often very optimistic and they're eager to participate in this kind of work. So don't forget about the high school astronomy clubs. Other wildlife conservation organizations, whether they are focused on invertebrate preservation or whether it's something like the Wetlands Conservancy, think about who else you can hook up with in this work. Neighborhood associations, I hear from a lot of people that have light trespass from a neighbor's light into their home. So I think that neighborhood associations are great places to go and do presentations and talk about the importance of managing our lighting better. Um, tourism organizations, 
that I just mentioned. University professors, absolutely critical partners in this kind of work, whether they are teaching ecology or urban ecology or um, architecture or landscape architecture, all of them can be great partners in advancing this work. Um, doing continuing ed with architects and lighting designers and planners, um, and even just finding professionals in the field that are um, that have a proclivity to some of this work, they can be excellent uh, partners. Sleep doctors that can speak to the issue of circadian rhythm impacts from light pollution. Uh, parks managers, whether it's at the state, city, or county level, even the national park level. In many cases, these folks are either making lighting decisions or they are managing existing lighting systems. So great to have them as partners, master gardener organizations, um, and then things like festival organizers, science pub organizers, um, folks at local theaters, folks that are putting together eco film festivals. Those are all great partners because they create opportunities to reach the public in ways that you might not otherwise reach the public just through your conservation organization. So I think those have been really important in terms of bringing, for example, Haru Memedinovich to Portland a number of years ago to present on his Skyglow project at a local theater. Um, I have given talks at the Portland Winter Light Festival, which is all about lighting it up. And I'm not there to rain on anybody's parade, but just to start to introduce some thinking about light we need versus light we don't need and how we design it well. Um, I mentioned um, wetland focused organizations. So we have partnered up with the Wetlands Conservancy to produce a flyer jointly and get the word out to their constituents as well. So things like that are something to think about when you're building relationships, really thinking outside the box. Um, engaging communities um, is actually the way that we start to build a conservation constituency. A lot of change happens at the individual level and in people's homes, and then people influence each other. So they're influencing their family members, their friends, their neighbors. And these are also the grassroots roots activists that we are gonna call upon later when we are trying to push legislative change. So it's really important that we are engaging the community. Um, Birds have been mentioned a bunch of times today. Uh, luckily, these days we have researchers who are using radar technology to track the movements of birds that are on migration and share lights out alerts that they are generating. So the plight of long distance migrants is actually one of the most captivating narratives for people that I have found. And even in talking with other folks outside of the bird conservation world, People just can't get over the fact that birds are migrating at night in huge numbers and that light pollution is affecting them. So this has been an incredibly effective campaign. Um, there are a lot of different entry points that people are gonna engage with um, light pollution work, but this one is incredibly successful. Some of our social media posts about this kind of stuff have generated um, something like nearly 100,000 contacts. So this is a massive way that we're getting the word out. Um, so uh, Dr. Shepard mentioned this in part about 80% of our North American migrants actually migrate at night. And Colorado State University's Aero Eco Lab and Cornell University are uh, folks at both of those locations are tracking bird movements and they are studying um, climactic patterns. So wind and precipitation, atmospheric pressure, and they are generating forecasts. They're learning to predict really big nights and bird, bird movements. So this is an example from May 4th, 2022 for Oregon. And we had a prediction of nearly 5 million birds that would be moving over Oregon that night, which generated a red alert for the Western and Eastern portions of the state and orange alert for the central part, part of the state. And we got the word out to our networks. Um, also broadcasting this through the Oregon Audubon chapter network statewide to get the word out to cities throughout Oregon. What we found the next morning when we checked the um, migration dashboard at, out of Cornell was that over 25 million birds had passed through Oregon the night before. So this was a huge night to get people thinking about turning off their lights. And really importantly, 
we are asking people to turn their lights off on these critical nights, but we are also messaging that what we want people to do is consider whether some of the behavior changes they engage in on these particular nights are things that they can continue to engage in year round. Um, this is also a little bit of a warm up for cities that are participating in seasonal lights out uh, programs to adopt lights out policies uh, per more permanently. So this can be a great inroad, a kind of pilot that they can see does crime increase? Are people complaining about it? Does this generate a lot of public support? And they can kind of get their, their, their arms around it before they adopt more permanent policies around something like this. Um, not incidentally, we are also asking local buildings to participate in these lights out um, alerts. So we are engaging both with residential folks and also building owners and managers and even policymakers at the local government level. So in the vein of asking people to change their lighting behaviors year round, in 2017, we launched a Take the Pledge to Go Lights Out program where we ask people to look around at their home lighting, see where they can apply best practices in lighting to their own home lights, turn off lights, especially during migration season, think about turning them off beyond that. We send them a yard sign that they can hang in their front yards to help um, raise awareness about this issue. We also ask them to email the mayor and city council to tell them that they've enrolled in this program. And then we ask them to get on our activist list because not at all incidentally, what we really wanna do is be building this grassroots activist network. So folks that are enrolled in our program are folks that we will call upon when we're trying to push for policy change um, both locally and statewide. And some of this is direct outreach to get folks to enroll in this program. A lot of our folks come through the Backyard Habitat Certification Program. So this is a program at Portland Audubon where we ask people to plant natives in their backyard to be good stewards for wildlife. And then the other piece of that is that we're asking people to manage hazards at home. So that's keeping your cats inside, managing windows so that you reduce collisions, and also managing your own home lighting. Um, so astrotourism is a hugely growing industry. More and more people are traveling to see the stars. I think this especially started to happen when people were traveling relatively locally during the pandemic. Um, but there's a ton of potential here to cultivate new activists. So there are also very real economic benefits for rural communities that might not otherwise have um, a huge influx, influx of tourists. So in Oregon, both Travel Oregon and Travel Southern Oregon are promoting this, and uh, both state and national parks are increasingly recognizing that the night sky is a resource that they can offer people that are visiting their parks and help people reconnect with the night sky. The other thing is that even if what we are really focused on doing, and I think that Dr. Barentine makes a really good point about much of our light pollution being um, originating in our urban areas, even if our goal is to curtail that light pollution in cities, Having places that people can go relatively nearby and get enchanted by the night sky helps build their relationship with this conservation ethic and wanting to preserve dark skies so that when they go back home, they recognize what they're missing and they care about it. So I think it's really important that we're thinking about preserving our night skies across the scale of urban landscapes to rural landscapes. Um, another way that we're engaging people is through the Oregon Skyglow Measurement Network. This is a program of the Oregon chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. So what we have is a network of sky quality meters. That's what this little guy is here up in the right-hand corner. It's battery operated. We have 39 of these deployed around the state of Oregon in both urban and rural areas. And what these units do is they take a snapshot of the night sky every five minutes all night long. And then whoever's hosting that unit downloads the data every three months, that gets rolled up into a report and it helps us track changes in the quality of our night skies statewide 
over time. Um, in some places, these units are deployed at locations where the land manager is hoping to pursue international dark sky place designation, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, in other places, it's just because folks are interested in helping collect data about this issue. Uh, at present, we have 17 more of these sky quality meters that are in discussion. And here's a map of where they are currently deployed. So all of the stars on this map show current locations of sky quality meters. Um, the circles on this map are locations in discussion. So you can see there's a cluster of them here on the south coast of Oregon. There's another cluster up here in the Columbia Gorge. We have a, a fair number of sky quality meters in urban areas in Portland. One of them is in my backyard, um, down in the Eugene area in central Oregon around Bend, and then we have some distributed out in much darker sky locations around the state. The locations circled on this map in red are already international dark sky places. And we're gonna talk about that as well. So in terms of engaging professionals, this is a really critical piece. Um, I think we need to be talking to professionals in the field and broadening their thinking about light pollution. Um, because these are really important change makers. So uh, International Dark Sky Places Program, this is run by the International Dark Sky Association. Hopefully folks have heard about this. This is really kind of a combination of both professional and community engagement. Um, so International Dark Sky Places are not just places that have incredibly dark skies. There's actually a range um, of parks, reserves, and sanctuaries that are relatively dark places. Also, international dark sky communities where residents of towns have gotten together and decided that they are interested in protecting the skies overhead, and so they seek a designation. And then there's also an urban night sky place designation. This is more primarily focused on outreach and education and teaching people about good lighting, uh, good lighting choices, best practices. And so the International Dark Sky Association helps support um, the pursuit of IDSP designation in places like state parks and even county parks. Um, we provide a fair bit of technical assistance. So evaluating the quality of the night sky, taking night sky photographs, things like that. And then Portland Audubon is really engaged in helping the city of Portland in a slow process of designated, designating one of their parks in Northwest Portland. So what we have done is we partnered with the city of Portland and also with Rose City Astronomers to hold uh, star parties, family friendly star parties at this park where folks come out, they can take an owl walk, they can take a bat walk, they can look at specimens of nocturnal creatures and also diurnal birds that are migrating at night. They can dissect owl pellets. And then we have a big star party where we're looking at constellations. And this is in service of eventually getting International Dark Sky Place designation at Washington Park. This is a map of International Dark Sky Places across the nation. And I think it really illustrates the national reach. I realize this is probably a little bit hard for some people to see depending on how big your computer screen is. Um, but all of the dots on this map represent either designated sites or sites that are in an application process. And right now, well, as of October, there were about 131 existing designations and 73 applications in the pipeline with the International Dark Sky Association. Um, interestingly, about 15 of those are in urban locations and about 60 of those represent communities that are interested in protecting their own night skies. Okay, so another way that we're engaging professionals um, is providing continuing education for architects and landscape architects. Um, this helps raise awareness for them about issues that they may encounter as they're doing projects. It starts to build buy-in from them. And this is really invaluable because if you have professionals pushing back against you when you're working on policy creation or even voluntary programs, that's going to make it so much harder to affect change. So getting out there, providing continuing education for the professionals, 
getting them on board, this is hugely important. Um, another thing that we do is we work with local schools. So the Portland State University School of Architecture program, also the University of Oregon School of Architecture program. We're going into classrooms. We're um, helping the educators talk to students about real issues that are happening out on the landscape. And we are starting to, let's say, indoctrinate the next generation of professionals with some of this thinking. We're really starting to shift the pa paradigms about glassy buildings and about how we design our lighting so that these students that are soon to be professionals in the field have some facility with it and are really already bought in. Um, also, organizing and participating in forums and symposia is a great way to educate our colleagues and, our, and other professionals. So here in Portland, we have something called the Urban Ecology Research Consortium that happens annually. Uh, Dr. Longcore has been up to give a keynote talk at one of those York events, and we've presented there on collisions and light pollution. A few years ago, the International Urban Wildlife Com uh, Conference was in Portland, and I put together a panel. Uh, Dr. Chris Shepard was in attendance at that to talk about collisions. So these are all really important ways that we can engage professionals. I'll also mention that in 2012, we developed a resource guide for bird-friendly building design. This was based on a template that Dr. Shepard created at American Bird Conservancy. We created a process for customizing that for the city of Portland, and we brought together a really large team of professionals, architects, landscape designers, um, planners, glass manufacturers, to sit in on this process of customizing this document because we really wanted to raise awareness and start to develop some local buy-in. Okay, and now we get to policy development, um, which brings us back to the opening from Assembly Member Lee and thinking about what we can do in the policy arena. Um, so folks probably have had some experience with this and know that policy development is really a long game. We rarely get what we want on the first push. So you got to have stamina for incremental process um, because that's often the way that we're affecting change. It gets incredibly, incredibly easier as others get out in front of us and change the status quo. But when we're on the leading edge of this, it really takes a lot of time and a lot of runs at this kind of thing. So this is just a brief timeline to illustrate the work that we've been doing in Portland since about 2009. We've made a lot of progress in the last 13 years, but there is still a ton of work to do. I have a strong feeling that I will retire from my job and that there will still be a lot of work left to do, um, which is great in terms of job security, I guess, for the next person. But I'll just walk you through this really briefly. In 2009, we started window collision surveys in Portland, recognized that we had a problem that we needed to start thinking about solutions to. In 2012, we released this resource guide for bird-friendly building design that I already mentioned. And actually, if we um, do an update to this, I'm, I'm planning on changing the name to bird-friendly building and lighting design because really that is a critical component of this document. Uh, that really set the stage for in 2015, getting the city to incorporate bird-friendly building and lighting design into their own green building policy, which meant that all city of Portland projects had to be built to these requirements. And then that further set the stage for in 2018, integration of bird safe exterior glazing code into our central city plan, which made it a requirement for all buildings in the central city. That was later expanded to the South Reach. Um, so more parts of the city that have this requirement as well. Um, from 2018 to 2022, we worked on this dark skies report and recommendations. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in depth on the next slide. So I'm gonna jump ahead to here we are in 2022. And we are currently working with the city to develop now a standalone dark skies appendix in the green building policy to expand on the existing standards that the city has to comply with. Um, Metro, which is a regional layer of government in our area has just as of October, adopted bird friendly building and lighting design as part of their uh, green building policy. And 
Back in 2020, we took a run at an Oregon State Dark Skies bill. Um, it started out as a fairly comprehensive bill that actually um, Dr. Barentine helped with significantly. Ultimately, it was such a packed legislative session, we rolled it back to a study bill and unfortunately it died without a hearing. But here we are at 2022 and we are taking another run at a state dark skies bill. I can tell you we have our eyes very closely on um, the bill that Assemblymember Lee had brought forward and we were really hoping that um, Governor Newsom was gonna sign that into law and that that was gonna grease the skids for our efforts up north up here. And unfortunately that didn't happen. So we are all you know, still in this incremental process, uh, progress phase. Okay, so now I'm just gonna, in this case study, get back to grassroots activism, helping push for policy development. So back in 2017, I mentioned that we launched this Take the Pledge to Go Lights Out campaign. Um, in 2018, folks that had enrolled in that program and had, had um, elected to be on our activist list, as well as other activists, helped push for funding for a Dark Skies initiative in the city of Portland, and we got the mayor to fund that effort. We then spent the next two years working with the city on a report. This was essentially a white paper on the state of light pollution around the world, and then specifically in Portland. And it was a 43 page document that included 15 recommendations for reducing light pollution in Portland. Um, we published that in 2020, it was adopted by city council. Everybody knows what was going on in 2020. It essentially started gathering dust on a shelf because there was no funding made available to start to implement some of the recommendations. Now, um, fast forward to 2022, and our grassroots activists have helped us put pressure on city council for actually funding implementation of this report, chiefly development of city code that looks at best practices in lighting design and what we can do to bring our city up to speed here. So this is kind of how we bring it all around. The folks that we have engaged on the individual and community level, in some cases, even on the professional level, help us affect um, policy advancements. And now I'm just gonna leave us with a few um, inspiring images that are hopefully some food for thought. I think that it is absolutely possible for us to have vibrant spaces outside at night in our urban, um, our urban areas that are appealing, that have really nice layered light that's warm, creating spaces that are inviting where people feel safe and that are not creating a lot of light pollution. So these are just a couple of photos up top from Prairie Line in Tacoma, which is a city to the north of us here in Washington, where they've done some pretty interesting lighting that's relatively low intensity, um, but also creating a vibrant space where people can hang out. And then Herman Lake Park in Houston, the two photos on the bottom left here that are creating um, really just gorgeous places to spend time. And this is in a highly urbanized environment. And then Vancouver, BC, some really interesting lighting that um, has been installed there as well. And a few more photos. So along the top, this is all the High Line Trail in Chelsea, New York. I think pretty much all of the lighting along this trail is relatively ambient lighting where you're not looking directly at light sources that again is creating a really beautiful space for people to occupy. And I think if they can do that in New York City, we can really do this anywhere, right? A couple of examples, sorry about that, on the bottom. So the lower left photo here is a building called the Fair Hair Dumbbell in Portland, um, not too terribly glassy. It incorporates public art. And unfortunately, just before this building opened, they went in and they installed this very high intensity LED lighting on the tops of all of the awnings above the entries to this building. And so that those light source, sources start here and they point directly up into the sky. Really unfortunate the way they decided to light this building. And then on the right here, we have more public art in the city of Portland in Southeast where the artist has elected to illuminate 
his painting from the top down. So a much better lighting scheme here than we see here. And I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Thank you all for your time and interest. Thank you so much, Ms. Coolidge. It was very helpful to hear about how the Portland metro area and the state are protecting birds and whole ecosystems by curbing light pollution. And it was especially helpful to hear all the different groups you partnered with. This can really serve as an example for our own municipalities looking to make a difference in protecting our dark skies. And I appreciate you saying that policy is really the long game. So we here in California will keep trying. Now, I'd like to bring all the speakers back up Thank you all so much for your illuminating, or should I say dimming, presentation. Uh, for those of us familiar with this topic, the four of you really are celebrities, and this feels like a celebrity moment for me to be able to have all of you in a Zoom together. So thank you so much. And for this final portion of our program, I'd like to bring Dasha Leeds into the room to moderate our Q&A discussion. Mr. Leeds is the conservation organizer for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. He has been an advocate for dark sky policies for four years and really helped push for the city of Cupertino's now adopted dark sky ordinance. We have quite a few audience questions already, um, but feel free to continue asking them in the Q&A section of Zoom. If we don't get to all the questions, we will try to get some written answers from our speakers that we'll send out in a follow-up email. So I will turn it over to you, Mr. Leeds. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, we've got a lot of questions here, so I'm just going to get started. Um, the first question will be uh, directed to all of the panelists, so anyone feel free to hop in to this one. Um, this question comes from Pat Peralta, uh, who asks, is the issue of light pollution part of the overall global environment and climate change discussion? <laughs> um, yes, Pat. In short, it is. We're in a little bit different situation than we would have been a few years ago because of how much LED light there is out there in the world now. In the old days, uh, after lighting was a lot less energy efficient than it is now, and we could draw a more direct line to influences like climate change. Um, but even that being said, and I kind of implied earlier in my talk that LED lighting was part of this problem and uh, by making it cheaper to consume light, it's prompting people to consume more. And it's possible that the environmental benefits have really been undercut because of the overconsumption of light. So I would say any opportunity we have to save on energy use by reducing our consumption of light at night, no matter what the type of light, no matter where we get our energy from, it's going to be better for the environment and it will be better in reducing climate change. Awesome, thank you. Um, we'll move on to our next question. Um, this question is directed specifically for uh, Dr. Longcore. This comes from Allison Hicks. Uh, can you comment on the effects of a uh, nightlight on human health? I find that information uh, is an additional motivator for policymakers and potential community advocates. I was personally told by my health provider to sleep in complete dark to prevent the recurrence of hormonally activated breast cancer. Yeah, so that's a whole nother, you know, our talk. Um, so we have circadian rhythms just like uh, every other uh, you know, species pretty much on the planet and disrupting them has adverse consequences. Some of the ones that we know the best uh, do in fact have to do with um, hormonal cancers like breast cancer. And that's, um, we know this both from a, uh, epidemiological perspective, meaning we have large populations of people who don't get uh, to sleep during the, the nighttime hours in the form of shift workers, and we and, and, and demonstrate higher uh, cancer rates with them. We have studies showing an associate, a statistical association between uh, satellite measured light at night and um, adverse health outcomes, including, including um, sleep, which has a whole series of, of cascading health impacts from it. That, that includes studies like when we had came out just last year, this year or something of the California teachers study where we looked at the effects of uh, light at night, uh, air quality, uh, noise, anthropogenic noise, and access to green space 
all together. And even when you account for all the th those other things, there is still a significant signal in terms of sleep uh, quality for people who are ex in areas that have excess uh, higher levels of light at night. Um, and so we also know in terms of the cancer, the mechanism, uh, the presumed mechanism, which is the suppression of the production of melatonin, uh, which is the hormone that, that uh, we produce in the, in the dark and um, have shown that uh, breast cancer tumors that are basically grafted onto laboratory mice and perfused with blood from either women who are exposed to light at night or not. Uh, the ones exposed to light at night have low melatonin levels. Those tumors grow. The ones that don't have light at night have high melatonin levels and it keeps the tumors from growing. So melatonin is it's called an oncostatic hormone. It keeps cancers from, from growing. You may have an incipient tumor, but it doesn't go anywhere if you've got uh, the right amount of melatonin. There are those who still would argue we don't have the smoking gun to conclusively prove uh, that uh, the way in which light is affecting health. Uh, but then again, it's incredibly difficult to get that just the way it's incredibly difficult to get it for smoking and cancer. Um, at a certain point when the epidemiological literature is consistent with the laboratory mechanistic studies, um, you, you, you kind of take the precautionary approach and uh, try to reduce the light at night for health, human health reasons as well. So there's plenty of research out there. That's just the, the tiniest little introduction from a geographer who's taught himself um, epidemiology as a side benefit of working on light at night. Awesome. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Longcore. Um, we'll move on to our next question here. And um, by the way, um, even though I may address future questions to specific panelists, um, if any, you know, if any of anyone, anyone else has answers for this question, feel free to raise your hand and hop in also. Um, so the next, this is just a general question for all panelists. Um, this is a combined question. It comes from Ann Schneider and uh, several others in the chat here, um, which is, uh, what are your uh, top recommended policy solutions for curbing light pollution? Um, for example, are these resources available um, for sp specific directions or language for general plans, uh, specific plans or ordinances? And uh, before I send this question out to everyone, um, I'll actually hop in and say that Cupertino has a really excellent combined uh, bird safe design and dark sky ordinance. Um, and I will now put the question to the panelists. Well, I would suggest to Anne and the others that there's a few things that you can put into any sort of a policy, whether it's a, a public policy like the lighting ordinance or uh, a corporate policy for a campus or you know a school district, which are, are often independent of their municipalities. There are very few basic um, lighting technical details that could be addressed in an ordinance. And um, Travis had a slide that showed a number of those about you know light, lighting only what you need in only the right amount, et cetera. And, and there are some simple ways to write those into policies that are quite effective if you have the will of the organization or the, the municipality or the voters behind it to actually implement those changes. And there are a few other things we try to prevent what we call over lighting, which is just putting too much light on one location. And so we can specify that in a couple of different ways. Lighting curfews to where you say that after a certain hour of night, most lighting has to be either dimmed or completely extinguished. That can be very um, effective. Um, and in my presentation, I noted that uh, we can do this through a zoning process as well, which works out really well where people have tried it to where you give people a little bit more allowance of light where there's more expected human activity at night. But you also, at the other end of the scale, you can have zones where lighting isn't allowed at all if there's no expected human presence. So those are the sort of core ideas that go into a lot of, of the kind of lighting policies that we try to get enacted at different levels here um, in this country. Um, there's certainly people taking interesting approaches above and beyond that, but I think any community uh, or company that wanted to look at those basic ideas uh, would really be doing a, a good service if they did. Mary, you got any to add? You know, I have long looked to Dr. Barentine for uh, all of the recommendations in terms of lighting ordinances and recommendations. So I think I'll leave it to his expertise. Yeah. 
Okay, I will uh, move on to our next question. Um, this question is directed at uh, Ms. Coolidge. Um, we've received uh, several questions on architecture. Um, and so how do we approach architectural design um, for schools or institutes? And um, how do we educate uh, professional architecture organizations? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start by saying everything I've learned about talking to architects I've learned from Dr. Shepard. Um, so American Bird Conservancy has a fairly standardized presentation that, is, that has been made um, eligible for continuing ed credit for AIA registered architects. Um, and that's something that I have also shared with architects relatively locally, though I've done some at, uh, at a distance as well. Um, so I think the, first of all, the idea would be to get registered to be able to provide that kind of training if you're interested and qualified, um, otherwise directing architecture firms to folks who are prepared to give those kinds of presentations. And I do a fair bit of emphasis in my presentations on the relationship between artificial light at night and collisions. Um, though most of the collisions that we see in this area happen during the day, they're not catastrophic at night collisions. Nevertheless, light is still playing a role in birds hitting windows. So um, one thing is that AIA registered class that can be offered. Um, another thing is that there are some architects that are not registered with AIA, but they still have to have state credentials. And so they are also required to keep up with a certain amount of continuing ed credits. Um, so they can take the class as well and be eligible for a certificate. And then in terms of getting into architecture offices, I mean, I cold call a lot of architecture firms. I do it less and less because now I have relationships with so many local architects. Um, and in those cases, folks start coming to me, particularly if they have a client who's interested in designing to bird safe specs, or if they've put up a building that has problems. And I see that a lot, particularly in schools. A lot of schools are really interested in daylighting their buildings and that's fantastic, but um, plenty of kids have a lot of trauma in their lives and birds hitting windows is not helping. So we do a lot of retrofit consultations with architects and even you know building occupants where they end up having a collision problem. So I don't know, Dr. Shepard, do you wanna add anything to that? I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, there are architectural conventions um, that you know you can speak at. Um, we try pretty much any way we can to reach as large an audience of architects as, as we can get to. Awesome, all right. Uh, we'll go on to our next question here. Uh, this one is directed uh, to Dr. Barentine. Um, this is sort of a, a dual question here. Um, uh, first part is, it sounds like the problem isn't just LED lighting, but that the cost of LED lighting has decreased and become more efficient, and that the solution is better design uh, legislation and awareness. Is that correct? So part one. And then um, part two is, uh, is there a cost difference between LED fixtures that provide responsible lighting and those that are creating the light pollution? Those are both great questions, and I'm I'm especially glad for the first one. Um, it, it's absolutely the case when I said that LED is making the problem worse. That is true, uh, and what I failed to mention was to follow that up by saying it remains my belief that if LED lighting were done well, it could save the planet. You know, not only does it have the characteristics with the high energy efficiency, but it, for example, that light is very directional unlike old sources where the light was sort of emitted more or less in all directions and we had to use optics and reflectors to try to, to shape the light as it emerged from a fixture. But LED has this exquisite level of control. Um, it's not used very much, but if we were to use that, we could very carefully craft exactly where we wanted that light to go. LED is dimmable. Um, earlier technologies that were used for, for wide area lighting did not have that capability. You couldn't really drop the light down below a certain level without actually changing the, the fixture or changing the brightness of the lamp. Um, 
And so you can turn it off and you can turn it back on. You can modify the spectrum that it emits. It has a lot of great qualities. What's missing is the sensitivity in enough lighting designers out there who are using it to know that it has this controllability and then to apply those controls in a way that results in reducing light. We, we think, and we have evidence to back this, that when people adopt these ideas of, you know, use the light only where it's needed and in the right quantity and the right timing, if people did that, they would find that they needed a lot less light to do the job. And if that's true, then we could naturally bring down the amount of light in the nighttime environment over time. And the, the public wouldn't even know that they had done it uh, because it's so well controlled. So that's absolutely true that it's a matter of the right design, the right regulation, the right application of that light uh, to, to get us to where we wanna be. To the second question, um, at this point in time, it, there's really no cost penalty on the, the commercial lighting market if you choose products that are what we would generally describe as dark sky friendly. So they're fully shielded, they're not emitting light up into the night sky, they have the right color temperature that Travis talked about. Um, it used to be that you paid more for those uh, features because there wasn't as much of a demand for them on the market. But I would say that due to the efforts of lots of people in this world of dark skies and light pollution over the past decade, that's really starting to drive the demand for better lighting products. Those are mostly standard offerings now for most lighting manufacturers. If you go and buy a, a street light, if your municipality is going to change out its old lights for new ones, uh, you kind of have to go out of your way to find a bad product now. And that's a good thing. So uh, yeah, the short answer is, is no, you don't pay more in order to make the right decision as we see it for protecting dark skies. The issue is the awareness so that people know to ask those questions and to choose the right products. All righty, thank you. Um, we'll go on to our next question. Uh, this one's directed at uh, Dr. Shepard. Um, in situations where clear glass allows birds to see completely through a wall or a building, uh, how effective are bird-friendly glazing treatments in reducing collisions? Oh, in, in that kind of situation, um, bird-friendly glass can do an excellent job. Um, obviously, you want the bird-friendly glass to be on both panels, whether they're parallel or, or meeting. Um, in some cases, like building connectors, um, it's actually an opportunity. It means that you could use, uh, you don't have to use a bespoke glass. You could actually use something like a window film um, because you can see through. Um, you, you're not so worried about the reflection. Um, so we've got products for every situation. All righty, thank you. Um, moving on to our next question. Um, this one is for Dr. Barentine. Uh, this comes from Alan Kaiser. Uh, he asks, is there any uh, data and information on the difference between perceived safety at night versus actual safety at night uh, due to artificial light? Also, uh, would it be beneficial, um, or also it would be beneficial to educate and communicate with uh, major cities, police chiefs, organizations, and associations? Um, maybe they have been concerned with glare causing auto and pedestrian accidents. Yeah, good question, Alan. Um, I'm, I don't know that there are studies that directly make that comparison between perceptions of safety and, and actual safety. They generally tend to be treated differently, but in cases where there have been studies in the same general area, in the same city, for example, um, if they are are constructed carefully, we could start to make some comparisons. Um, I should mention that a lot of these studies, first of all, it's difficult to get them funded. Um, second, it's especially where anything having to do with crime um, during the overnight hours is, it's very difficult to get useful information out of the data and to, to put together really meaningful studies. So there's a lot of ambiguity uh, in the literature that's out there. Um, as far as I can tell from what I have looked at, there's not a, a huge correspondence between the perception of safety and actual safety. A lot of people have in mind that a, a brighter outdoor space is safer at night. I showed the example from the, the study done in Israel where you get a, a, a really big boost in a perception of safety when you go from no light to a fairly dimly lit space. And you keep getting those feelings increasing as you go to higher light levels. 
but it flattens out very quickly. So if you light a space up like day, you don't get the same perception on the part of people that are out there than if you're lighting to a fraction of that. Um, as far as whether that yields actual safety, whether it's crime or, or traffic safety, for example, um, there, it really depends on the circumstances. There are instances where we see definite improvements when we add light. There are cases where we see decreases uh, where, where things are going the wrong direction because light has been added um, or there is too much light. The uh, classic example is if you overlight a parking lot and there is a tendency to do this because people are afraid going to and from their cars at night, you end up creating shadows between the cars. And if you're worried about your personal safety at night, not only is it hard to see obstacles in those shadows, but then you're also giving a you know, potential criminal perpetrator a place to hang out and wait for you essentially. Uh, so you can go too far in the other direction and create these other externalities that are, are not helpful to the situation. And I, I agree, we need to do more outreach with um, law enforcement organizations, especially because there's, there still is a pervasive sense in law enforcement that the closer you are to, to daylight at night, the safer things are, the more secure they are, even the majority of crimes happen during the daylight hours. Um, and so there's an education that can be done there to improve that situation. And also, I've talked to plenty of people in law enforcement who actually do fundamentally get it, and they will bring up examples like light sources that yield a lot of glare that makes it difficult for them to do their jobs. So we, again, we should be using these great characteristics of lighting when it's done properly to make the world an actually safer place at night rather than just uh, trying to reassure ourselves that simply because the world is brighter that we're going to be safer existing in it. Yeah, John, maybe I can add a, a thing or two on top of that, which is um, one on the on the glare issue. We, I helped uh, the consultant team that wrote the new um, street light master plan for Salt Lake City. And part of that process was uh, outreach and meetings with all the city agencies and interest groups and whatnot. And police and fire uh, were very much interested in getting the newer LEDs that were very blue glaring uh, toned down because it was blowing out their cameras. Now that means that you're bought into the whole surveillance state. We can talk about that another time, but the police were actually, you know, interested in in better, more, higher quality lighting uh, because they were finding that the new lights were were rendering some of their existing resources inoperable. That's one thing. Second is the sort of this issue of perception versus actual safety. There are some paradoxes that happen here as well. Um, along roads, people who think that that they're well lit and would be seen by oncoming cars act in ways that are less safe than people who feel like it's dark and that they won't be seen by the oncoming cars. And so sometimes when you give people light and they get they get a false sense of safety that then leads to behaviors that end up in more accidents. Third thing is about the roadway issue. We do have some studies out there and you might hear them cited if you're involved in this field about color temperature and, and ability to see roadway obstructions. And uh, arguing that a higher color temperature, one with more blue, sort of white, uh, you know, colder white color with more blue in it, allows you to see an obstruction farther away on the roadway uh, at 4,000 Kelvin uh, color temperature versus 3,000 or 2,700. Uh, and they've done this study in a number of different cities. And I, I was really curious about this. So I pulled it together and I looked at these detection distances across all of the cities. And it turns out there was a bigger difference in the detection distance between the cities than there was between the color temperatures within the cities. And so there's more going on here than just the, the top line research that has maybe been, and I know the, the guys who've done this research, so I'm not trying to um, trash talk them, but you know, I think they probably agree. We need to do a better job of connecting actual changes in lighting to actual accidents on the road before we go policy-wise. Because there are th some things that we do know, right? Uh, lighting an intersection uh, is it reduces accidents relative to not lighting the intersection. But fascinating fact, if you take an intersection, it's so a rural in, you know, intersection, North Dakota, middle of nowhere, two roads come together, that kind of an intersection. If you just put a stoplight there and no street lighting, you reduce the accidents 
far, far, far more than by illuminating it. So sometimes the, the, the choice that is given to us is between you either light this up right, you know, to standards or you don't light it all. When there may be actually a third choice that's safer, um, that, that actually produces less, less, um, less um, adverse consequences in terms of light pollution. So this is uh, an area, luckily, and I think you know, John would agree because he's on some of these committees too, where we, we're finally at a point internationally now where the roadway safety people and the light pollution folks who, and the, sometimes the medical circadian rhythm researchers and whatnot, we're all finally getting on the same committees in the same room to hash these things out together. Whereas in the past, the roadway lighting recommendations from the International, I, I'm sorry, the Illuminating Engineering Society, for example, it was in John's presentation is like, these are not science-based recommendations because the process to make those recommendations was the people on the committee had to come to unanimous consent about what the standard was going to be. So any one person on the committee who could be Joe, and it usually was a Joe, um, lighting guy from Nebraska, um, or wherever it might be, nothing against Nebraska, just using a, a random state, um, could say, no, I think it should be brighter. And, in, and if he held firm, the, the recommendations ultimately would say what they said. It didn't have to be connected to any scientific finding whatsoever. So we're in the beginning stages, I believe, of, of an overhaul of these kinds of regulations so that scientists, biologists, traffic safety are in the room and trying to make sure that these recommendations are at least science-based um, and, and not simply, these are the 10 people around the country who work in lighting and they think this is how bright your road should be. Sorry, IES, to undermine your previous pro processes, but that's literally how it worked. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll go on to the next question here. Uh, this one is for Dr. Shepard. Um, where can we source bird-friendly glass for home projects? Uh, for example, Ornolux has great UV reflective patterns on glass, but they're in Europe, and it's unclear to me how to actually get, say, triple pane windows, sorry, it's unclear to me how to actually get, say, triple pane windows, which incorporate this glass for homes in California and Colorado. Yeah, at this point, it's very difficult to get uh, bird-friendly glass in home windows, and um, it's always a, a custom job, and it always costs a lot. Um, in, in many ways, it's actually more effective to use a retrofit um, to design your house to incorporate um, one of the solutions that you can put on existing glass. Um, so, you know, there you can use anything from external solar shading um, to, um, if you know what an Ecopian bird saver is, you can actually make them retractable. Um, you, you don't necessarily need uh, bird friendly glass, and it tends to be manufactured, as you say. Um, to go into insulated glass units. So it, it doesn't actually fit into the frames that are used for home windows. Um, there is some interest at this point on the part of the glass industry in creating bird from the home windows, but I think it's gonna be a while. Um, meanwhile, use external insect screens, you know, wherever you can. Yeah, I'll just add to that and say that Dr. Shepard is right on the money. And I have had one experience where Audubon was renovating a property that we have up on Mount Hood. And I was insisting that the windows be bird friendly. And what we ended up having to do was source the glass from Glass Pro, which is a glass manufacturer in California that does make a UV product. And we sourced the frames from Geldwin, a residential window maker and we had a third party put them together. It was actually less expensive than buying the high-end residential windows that they had originally specced for the property. So it can be done, but it definitely took a lot of footwork to put together the glass from Glass Pro, the frames from Geldwin, and then a third party that would put them together for us and install them. So and it is an glasses, option. Yeah, UV glass isn't going to work for things like pigeons and doves, raptors. Um, so especially if you want bird-friendly windows because you're building a home, you know, in a wooded area, you're you're better off um, 
finding something that's going to be more effective, um, even though it's a retrofit. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to the next question here. Uh, this one is uh, to all panelists. This one is from Janet McIntosh, uh, who asks, uh, how about any uh, specific film recommendations uh, for films we can recommend for our local annual social justice film festival? Oh, yeah, I threw one suggestion in the chat for that. There's a film called Saving the Dark by Sriram Murali, who is a an uh, East Indian filmmaker. It's a really beautiful film. It was made, uh, you know, seven years ago now. So it's not fresh. It's not hot, hot off the press, but it's a great film. And he's generally very generous about sharing the rights to it so that you could show it at a film festival for free. Okay, awesome. Uh, moving on to our next question. Uh, this one is for uh, Dr. Berentine uh, from Ann Schneider again. And the question is, how can smaller cities work together, uh, reducing costs by quantity and spreading out staff time? Uh, a checklist and best practices would be great. Uh, that's a that's an interesting question, and I haven't found a lot of of cooperation in a regional sense. I think it's still kind of early uh, for that. But the notion of pooling resources is an important one, given that if you want to do a serious update of your municipal lighting, that's a, still a big upfront capital cost for a lot of smaller cities and towns. Uh, and that they they might, especially if they were served by a uh, utility or a co-op that installs and manages the lights, they might have a little bit better sort of collective bargaining power, if you will, if they got together in order to do that. But I'm not sure I can point to a specific example as a, a sort of a best practice because it's it's just been a, a very unusual thing up to this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is going to be for Ms. Coolidge. Um, what have been the most challenging aspects of your advocacy work? Um, where have you faced the most resistance? And uh, what would you recommend for a new advocate starting out in this field? Um, I, I think that one of the most challenging things in my mind in our time is the perception of crime and lighting. And it's, you know, it's fairly intractable. I can tell you that my partner's car was stolen from right in front of our house directly under a street light. Her catalytic converter was stolen from the car directly under the street light. We don't live in a bad neighborhood. It's just the, it's the um, current condition of some of our cities or at least of Portland. And so crime has really shot up. And I think that people are using light as a hopeful means of reducing crime. The other thing that I really see happening is that jurisdictions are using light a lot to deter unhoused folks from hanging around or camping. And at least where that is concerned, and you know, frankly, from the crime standpoint as well, the solutions have to be so much more thoughtful and nuanced and multifold rather than just this idea that if we shine a giant light on something, we won't have more houseless people and we won't have crime. Um, so I think that that's one of the hardest things. And, you know, I, I really do think that, that this issue of perception is so important because, you know, in many cases, we believe what we're told. There are so many ways in which there's kind of the status quo of group thinking, and we perpetuate that. And there is this idea that more light equals less crime. And I think that we have to figure out how we can start to shift that general um, that general thinking. I know I lead birding trips, and if you tell people they're having a great time and they've seen all kinds of great birds, they feel like they're having a great time and have seen all kinds of great birds. And if you tell people they're having a crappy time and we've missed all the good birds, that's exactly how they feel. It's, uh, it's astonishing to me how much you can really influence the way that people feel about things just by speaking with authority. So I think, you know, there's this issue of talking with law enforcement that Dr. Barentine brought up. And I think that's a really important place that we need to spend some time and energy is thinking about how we can start changing some of this overall messaging. 
Um, I think there was a second part of that question that was maybe about advice for advocates. And I think I would just say, you know, to build your relationships thoughtfully, um, you know, make them go into relationships intending to have them for a long time. Um, and, you know, make sure you're really, really building a pretty diverse coalition of folks who are working with you because it's going to take, it's going to take every different direction of coming at this, I think, to really start to make a lot of change. Cool. All right. I will move on to the next question. Um, we've received several questions about specific types of lighting installations, and this is for all panelists, by the way. Um, questions about holiday lighting, art uh, lighting, stadiums, rail stations, airports, and billboards. Um, do you know whether there are regulations that address uh, these diverse types of lighting already? I can say that there are there are spot examples in particular codes in different parts of the country that will address those. A lot of cities, if they have a lighting ordinance, for example, they probably have something about holiday lighting. Um, you know, putting some boundaries on the calendar dates when it can be up and, and either allowing or prohibiting certain kinds of lighting. Um, there are fewer examples for other very specific applications. You might see flagpoles as a, a type of, of lighting that's specified in an ordinance. Um, you might see distinctions made between uh, commercial and industrial type uh, zoned uses versus residential, and they might get different allowances for different sorts of, of, um, of applications. Uh, string lighting. So outside of the holiday period, uh, you'll see where, for example, restaurants with outdoor seating areas like to have the string lights for some ambient lighting. And, and we really don't have a lot of good examples for how to regulate that. Um, sports facilities, the International Dark Sky Association publishes some guidelines for doing sports lighting as well as you can in a way that's sort of dark sky friendly that some communities are, are slowly beginning to take up. Uh, so it, it really depends. You can take any kind of, of application, no matter what it is, and you can apply these general principles that we've been talking about so far. Um, but it is true that you know the, the way you get into the particulars of a sports stadium is different than you would for holiday lighting. And we're still figuring this out as we go along. Um, one thing that I will add on to what Mary said about building your coalitions that relates to this is pick your battles. I advise uh, communities that are writing holiday lighting restrictions into their codes that don't already have them to not be the Grinch that stole Christmas because no one likes that person, right? Probably in the big scheme of things, holiday lights are not that big of a deal in terms of light pollution and people like them. And when you try to take them away, people get upset about that. To be honest, I'm a lot more worried about the, you know, the floodlights on the side of a building that are running all night long every night of the year or the parking lot lights that are on at three o'clock in the morning when no one's parked there. That's what I'm gonna go after before I'm gonna go after holiday lighting. And your coalitions will appreciate that. You have to remember there's a human dimension to what we're trying to accomplish here. And we can't just go in and say, well, we're the experts and we know what's best for you because we know how that tends to go. We need to build the coalitions, get people on board with these ideas, bring them to the point that they want things to be different. And then when they're, they're ready to make changes, we're there to advise them on what the right things are to do. I was just going to say we could get in if you, if you were interested. There are weeds on all these things, right? Um, there's a new recommended practice for uh, digital billboards that limits, uh, but it's not a regulation. It's a recommended practice from the IES that limits the total amount of light per per square meter, basically, uh, that that they're allowed to emit if you want to comply with the recommended practice. Um, and, and you could, if it's, if it's less than what you've got going on in your, uh, your local uh, area, you can make that argument and you might be able to point to those, those, uh, documents from the IES that, that, that are better than what you're currently getting. Um, you know, the thing with, with stadium and sports lighting there, they can't, when they're on, they're a huge contributor to overall sky glow, huge, huge, huge. And, um, the, the the keys when when I get calls from people saying they're proposing you know lights in my town and blah 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 it's like okay the human dimension right 
is this going to happen? If it's going to happen, how do you figure out how to make it the least worst it can be? And so here are the things you need to think about. Writing curfews into the actual permitting, uh, enforceable curfews, like it's never going to be on after 10 o'clock at night. It, they get uh, 10 nights during football season and that's it whatever it is, the, the, the limiting that, that, that duration. Second is making sure that they've gone for and gotten the best um, shielded lights possible. Uh, and there are companies that really, really specialize in getting that light on the field where it needs to go and not elsewhere uh, and not spill. Um, that's another thing to make sure that you can do. The other one is the color temperature, how much blue it is, because the more blue it is, the more it's gonna scatter, the more sky glow. There's, there's a, there are different ratings uh, for levels of play that require different color temperatures. And so if you're gonna be like broadcast on TV, you need a certain color temperature. But if you're playing you know, non-TV broadcast, um, you know, rec ball, it's a completely different thing and making sure they're not designing to a higher sports field lighting standard than is it's actually going to be used for. And then the other one is never believe anybody when they says an installation is going to be temporary. Make them <laughs> make them make them get the permits from the start. It is never temporary. It always gets converted to permanent um, once once it's up. Um, and so sorry, that was my 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 inner activist coming out on on that one a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, and some things, you know, it, it, art, right? How did we, how did how did this all get started? How did the that book and the conference get started back in 2002? Well, we got galvanized by an art project at the Port of Los Angeles that would have taken uh, what was it, 11 7,000 watt xenon sky tracker floodlights and pointed them straight up into the sky, 24, you know, every night, all night. And we got together and with a fancy artist uh, who was saying that this was art and this was for the community and it was a gateway to Los Angeles and, got, and built a coalition with uh, Catherine, Rich and I with the astronomers, our local you know, astronomical community, uh, with some ecologists with very, you know, when it wasn't really put together and people ultimately in the neighborhood who had been passing the hat to save their pennies to light this bridge but all they'd asked for was little tracer lights to go across the bridge. They didn't want a big art project that was going to be done by some highfalutin artist who, you know, parachuted in from somewhere else. They just wanted little tracer lights on their bridge. And so ultimately, by the time we were done, coalitions, we got the California Coastal Commission to say, no, that's a significant adverse impact on coastal zone resources. And when they redesigned, we supported them when they said, oh, can we just do tracer lights like the community has been asking for and putting on their, their uh, visualizations all this time? We're like, yes, let's do that. Um, because it, you know, <laughs> that coalition was gonna stand, right? Um, and it, and it res respected the, the, the local community because they, they knew about light pollution because they are next to the port, which is just chronic light pollution, uh, except it's coming at their neighborhoods and at their windows instead of shooting straight up into the sky. So we were able to reinforce their feelings about their own environment and the things that really are dumped on them as a port community and be, uh, allow them to have the beautification that they wanted. Um, so every one of these things has nuances. Okay, all right. We are uh, running close to the end of our time here. So I think uh, we're uh, gonna have one last question to wrap up our Q&A session. This is sort of a general one to all panelists, which is um, in about one minute or so, do you have any closing thoughts for everyone here today? Everyone can make a difference. There is no act that is too small or too insignificant. And I think it's only by that collection of small acts that will add up to bigger acts that will eventually solve this problem. And I feel good about the prospects. I completely agree. Can we um, all just second what John said? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's important to, to do something. And if you can get yourself to do something, you're more likely to do it again. Um, and if you can work with people and get them to do just one small thing, any kind of commitment will get people you know, down that trail and will get them to be more likely to be sympathetic to the next thing. Um, yeah. So that's it's just really important. To, you, you think what I do can't be important, but it is. The great thing for me about this topic is, um, even though we've got the crime issue to kind of deal with a little bit, um, 
in general, people intuitively get it that shining light on things that are supposed to be in the dark is kind of bad for them. People get it when there's a light that shines in their window when they're trying to sleep. They understand it if you phrase it that way for other wildlife. And you can work with that intuitive empathy um, and, and make progress. And yeah, we've all got a long way to go, but we can, we can make progress. Yeah, I would sort of piggyback on that and say, you know, keep envisioning the world you want to live in and keep working towards it. And, you know, I think a lot of people that haven't engaged with their local legislators don't know how impactful it can be to engage and, you know, to speak up and to write a letter or attend a hearing. And it really makes a huge difference. I mean, so many people don't participate that your participation absolutely counts. So get out there, show up for action alerts, talk to your legislators, think about what you can do to live in the world you want to live in. Awesome. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for answering questions. And thanks to everyone who sent in questions. And thanks to uh, Shawnee and Ronnie who helped filter those in for us. I'll pass it on now to Annie. Great, thank you so much. This brings us to the end of our program today, Light at Night, a Glowing Hazard. Thank you so much to Assemblymember Lee, to our wonderful speakers today, Dr. Longcore, Ms. Coolidge, Dr. Barentine, and Dr. Shepard, and Mr. Leaves, thanks for moderating. Thank you all to the organizations who support our symposium, and thank you to you, our audience members, for sticking with us for the last few hours. We hoped you learned more about the harmful effects of light at night and have taken away some strategies to mitigate this problem. And we hope we've inspired you and motivated you to go out and advocate for dark skies. So on behalf of the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society and the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter and the Bay Alive campaign, we hope you will join us to make the Bay Area safer for wildlife and the environment and for us as residents. Thank you and have a good rest of your afternoon.